We're rolling. Rolling. Oh, there's Joan. Perfect. Just wait for audio to, to come in there. Good evening, Councillor Gatward. Okay. Good evening. Um, so we've got everybody present now. Uh, so we're going to get this meeting underway. I would like to call to order Administration and Operation Committee meeting for Tuesday, March the 16th. Um, we've taken attendance. Everybody is here now with attendance. Uh, you will notice that there was an addendum sent out this afternoon for the agenda. Uh, my understanding is it was a recommendation added to 4.2. Is there anybody that would wish to add anything else to the agenda this evening? Seeing none, looking for an approval of the agenda with the addendum. Councillor Coleman, Councillor Laferriere, any questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, declaration of pecuniary interest, uh, please do so at the time if there is any. Uh, we'll move on to delegations. We've got a couple of delegations this evening. Uh, first delegation is John Gilson on behalf of the Brant Pickleball Club. Um, John, are you with us? There he is right there. Uh, welcome. I will pass the floor over to you and you can do your presentation and we'll go from there. Reminder, you have 10 minutes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Administration and Operations Committee members. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Brant Pickleball Club on, a, on a, the uh, topic of pickleball. In your agenda package, you received my presentation on a sport that has a bit of a strange name, pickleball. And I won't be reading that to report because you have that there, but I'll highlight a few things in it. For those not familiar with the sport, the first part of the presentation is a description of what pickleball is about and why it is so popular and the fastest growing sport in many parts of the world, especially with seniors over 50. But it is also finding favor with the younger crowd, including children. If we don't have dedicated pickleball courts, the game is played most often on tennis courts with its own set of boundary lines. A pickleball court is the exact size of a badminton court, so it is much smaller than a tennis court, thus making it a popular sport with seniors. In the presentation that you have, there are some pictures of the game in action. Two of those pictures show many people, or a good number of people, at a pickleball clinic held behind Paris District High School. Pickleball is a fun game where you meet new people while at the same time getting some great exercise for your mind and body. In the presentation that you have, I have also given a, given a little history of pickleball in Paris, how it got started and what we are currently doing. Here in Paris, we have been playing pickleball for four years now, and this summer it will be the fifth year. The Board of Education has given us permission to play on the four courts, the tennis courts behind Paris High School. However, the Board of Education will not allow us to have any permanent pickleball lines painted on the courts, but we are allowed to use sidewalk chalk. So we have been chalking the boundary lines for four years now. It's not easy having to chalk the courts almost every time we play and especially after every rain shower, as rain does a good job washing away sidewalk chalk. Two years ago, we were promised uh, three pickleball courts here in Paris on Hartley Ave. We could use at least four courts, but apparently because of limited space in the park, there is only room for three courts. However, as of this point in time, there are no indications on when these courts will be built. The parks and facilities people told us that they are waiting for the go ahead to obtain tenders. We have well over 50 active pickleball players and decided last fall to be named the Brant Pickleball Club to keep in with the theme and mission of the county council representing all of Brant County and not just Paris. In fact, we do have a number of players from the county. We want to encourage the decision makers to please allow for tenders so we can get these courts built. In the presentation that you have, you will see that we do not get a lot of playing time for a popular sport. The Paris Tennis Club is also very active in Paris, and that's a good thing. And so there is also much demand for them to use the courts behind the high school as well. 
Paris is growing at a very fast pace and the demand for pickleball will continue to increase. It would be great if we could play six days per week in both the mornings and afternoons, because then we could set up clinics and offer programs for players of all ages. And we could offer them at different times of the day, including even in the evening for those who work during the day. We also need some indoor courts in a community center or a sports arena, especially during the winter months. If, if there are going to be changes at the Brand Sports Complex or another facility in the area, we hope that pickleball will be allowed to be a part of that. Uh, please do not forget about us. We have the players. We just need the courts to play on. We know that you care about the seniors. I was reading about Engage Brant, or people to make Brant County a better place to live, work, and play as the county develops an age-friendly community plan for those who are 55 and older. And that age group is the group that plays a lot of pickleball. This social sport does support the physical and mental well-being of its players. I was just reading an online article sent to me by my ward counselor that this sport is experiencing a pandemic boom growth growing at a rate of over 20% per year. If you supply the courts, we will supply the players. I will end by stating and emphasizing that the parks and facilities people have been very helpful and supportive. Lisa Coco and Kathy Ballantyne and others have always been there for us and helping us get organized in Paris, providing what we needed. We can't say enough about their support, but their support is limited too, and that is why we are making a plea to this committee to help the Brant Pickleball Club get their promised courts on Hartley Ave. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, John. Um, yeah, it didn't seem that long ago when uh, Councillor Chambers brought up pickleball. I don't think uh, too many of us had heard it before that, but it has definitely grown since that time for sure. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Any questions? Councillor Gatward, and then the Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Mr. Gilson. Um, that's very nice that you're considering it a Brant club. And you mentioned you have players coming from other parts of the county. And thank you for the great presentation. My question is, are you aware that the tennis courts at Burford and tennis courts at Mount Pleasant are also available for your use for pickleball? Yeah, there's tennis courts there. Uh, there's also tennis court or uh, yeah, courts at uh, near the airport um, and I think there's now ten, also courts in St. George uh, and in Scotland there is as well and there is even the number of courts in air but we would like to play here in Paris too and we're a fairly big town and we, we don't, I don't want to drive 20-25 minutes every time we want to go out and play pickleball so it's nice to have something locally when we have the population here to support that. We have played in Brantford before but to go to some of the places in Brantford, it does take a bit of driving to get there, you know, I guess. but some people may not mind the driving, but I'd rather play three minutes from here or five minutes from here rather than going, going to uh, Burford through the traffic and so on. Okay, thank you. And who, my last question is who promised you three courts on Hartley Ave? Uh, that's, yeah, we've, through the uh, parts, the, through your parks and rec people. They brought the plans uh, and showed us the plans and so on, and they look very good. Um, but there are just the three courts. Well, that's better than nothing, certainly. And uh, so no, we, do, we have seen the plans that, that apparently have been approved. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think, I think, um, Having your courts in Paris is a really great idea. When people come and watch pickleball, do they do they stand around? Do they bring lawn chairs, or would you want bleachers of some sort? Um, it, some places have bleachers, but most places uh, they have uh, people bring their own lawn chairs, and some places have uh, those plastic chairs that that remain there at court side that people can uh, sit and watch as well. Right now here. We don't really have any benches to sit on in the courts. There's one, there's a couple of benches now, 
uh, here behind the high school, but most a lot of people still bring their lawn chairs, and that's fine too. Yeah. So if you if you had your courts in Paris, then I mean all all the tennis courts around the county would be great for some sort of a pickleball tournament or something, and everyone could just go from community to community and, and use it as a round robin sort of event. Yeah, yeah, the, we, we would do that. Uh, it'd be nice to have some competition or, or a ladder tournament or something like that. Um, it, it, it is a great, a person can actually, you know, what's, and that's why the seniors like it, you can learn to play the game in an hour, uh, within an hour, and uh, you can already be good at it. <laughs> and uh, But um, it'd be nice to have be able to give them clinics. But last year we stopped doing clinics because we were just getting too many people and we didn't have the playing time for them. Um, so we have the uh, sort of the opposite problem of Brantford. Brantford has a lot of indoor courts. They're all over the place. The Y has a number of them. Um, Doug Snooks has a, a, a few of them and so on. They're, they're all over the, the city, but they don't have the outdoor courts. We at least have had four courts out, out uh, behind the high school that we use. So next Monday, I see that uh, um, Fred Winterbon, who is sort of the uh, key person for pickleball in Brantford, um, is meeting with... Uh, Brian Hughes, who's head of Parks and Recreation, and John Sless, they're going to be meeting at Lions Park and going to be talking about how they can use or put up uh, pickleball courts in Lions Park. So they get because because this past summer with the COVID having shut down all indoor play, uh, we've had quite a few a number of people from Brantford come down to play daily or, or we play three three days a week they come down to play here in Paris and uh, we don't turn anybody away. I mean, we're happy to have them there too. Well, I think, I think your timing is perfect. So thank you for presenting tonight and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Gilson? Okay. Seeing none, I thank you very much for your presentation and uh, we'll proceed from here. Um, okay. Councillor Howes, you had a question? Uh, not not a question, Mr. Chair. I just do we want to deal with this now or later? Um, we can deal with it now if committee's okay with that. How do we want to How do we want to proceed with this, Councilor Howes? Uh, I, I move that we receive this presentation as information and request a quick staff report on how to bring this project back to life sooner rather than later. If there's a seconder to that, I can speak to it a little bit further. We have a seconder for that. Mayor Bailey. Go ahead, Councillor Howes. Right, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I that was a that was a, a a great presentation and a and a great illustration, I think. And and the timing is significant. We we've been in pandemic pause mode for a year. And and it seems to me after you hit a certain point of a state of emergency, it's it's not so much a state of emergency anymore. It's the it's the new normal or some new variation of normal. I, I think this is one example of of a number of projects that, that we need to bring back to life um, uh, sooner rather than later for, for the benefit of everybody in our community. Thank you for that. Councillor Laferia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to um, not officially second, but uh, I want to support Councillor Howe's motion. Uh, this is something that has come to Council. I remember speaking about pickleball uh, at the beginning of our term, uh, this term, um, and I believe it's something, as as Mr. Gilson has said, has been approved. Um, my wife and I, we played, and this is an excellent sport to have outside, uh, especially even in pandemic times, because the, you can do couples and and family people who are already in a bubble can play on one team against people on another team without uh, the sort of dangers we see in other sports or if we had to do this in, indoors. Uh, and also, we I, I don't know about other folks here, but I know I constantly get calls from the, the tennis folks in town and they're, they're pretty stressed already because they're a very, as Mr. Gilson said, very busy club as well. Uh, so I think that there's uh, definitely a desire to see this. And I know the pickleball community in, in Paris and in the County of Brant is only gonna grow. It's pretty popular as it is. And Mr. Gilson talked about uh, older folks, but my goodness, there's a lot of young people, a lot of young couples um, also that, that do this because it's something you can do uh, you know, uh, with your kids or something you can do with a, a partner. Um, okay. it, uh, just, just so people are aware too, the, the, the reason three or even four, if it's possible, is, is helpful is because uh, you'll often get you know, 30, 40 people to come to 
to to pickleball and they rotate the use of the the space so it, it's one of those things where you do maybe 15 20 minutes and then you watch for 15 or 20 minutes and then you get back in for 15 or 20 minutes uh so to to, to drive 20 25 minutes to play for 20 25 minutes is it's not really a great use of time um I'm very supportive of this and i hope staff come back to us with a very good uh, recommendation anything else uh speaking to the motion speaking to the motion councilor gatward Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it um, looks like fun. Um, and I was going to try it once with my grandkids, but it got canceled. That was during the Healthy Kids program that our rec staff put on. Um, but I'm just wondering in the meantime, if it's, you know, if it starts to pick up as the weather gets nicer, um, for the people in the north or the south end of Paris, it's only a 15 minute drive to Burford. And they could try out some of the other courts or the ones in the airport area. If there's a big demand, it just might help take some of the pressure off and give pickleball players more opportunities because like it was just stated, the tennis clubs are really growing and they want the time. So in the meantime, <clears throat> utilize the facilities that we've got because the Board of Education isn't even using the tennis courts in Burford now. Anyway, that's just a comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. Any other speak to the motion? Okay. So we've got a motion, we have it seconded, no further questions. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? That's carried. So that will go to staff. We'll get a report back as to uh, how we can expedite things up on uh, okay. at the North End. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, on to our next delegation. We've got uh, Jeff Leader and Karen Murray Hoff, is it? Did I pronounce that correctly? Um, we're gonna speak of the uh, Glenn Morris and seasonal parking restrictions. And I will, I'm not sure which one of you is going to speak, but uh, by all means, the floor is yours. And again, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Is the slide deck going to be uh, placed up? Or... Uh, Adam, it is being placed as we speak. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm just going to change my screen here. Okay. Good evening from Glenn Morris. I'm Jeff Leader, and with me tonight is Karen Murray Hoff. I've lived in Glen Morris for 16 years with my wife, who's lived here for 23 years, and we were raising a young family. We're very fortunate enough to live here, um, but we also understand how rare and unique this natural environment is. This proposal that we are bringing forth tonight should, go, should be a good first step in making this a wonderful place to live and visit. I would like to thank everyone in advance for taking the time to consider this proposal, and I would also like to thank Councillors Wheat and McAlpine for all of their support. This should come as no surprise, tonight we are requesting Council to consider a resolution for an interim solution in order to help alleviate the invasion of over-tourism on the Glen Morris community and turn this amusement park back to the natural heritage resource that it is. We have strong support from the Glen Morris community for a permitted resident parking system, which we are proposing this evening. The system may have also have application in residential areas around Pemmins Dam and Bean Park. We are restricted in the amount of time we have. However, for your consideration, included in your agenda package and at the end of this presentation are a couple more slides, including additional recommendations and a future outlook. I'll hand it over to Karen to go over some of our concerns. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jeff, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm hoping that you've all had an opportunity to have a good look over our presentation prior to tonight. And in relation to the current issues and problems that are listed here, I will say that the recurring theme is uncontrolled use. What began as a rail trail and parking lot on a narrow, dead-end residential street has now become a county park, a river access, a trail, used in all seasons for many different activities with no limits on public use. The World Tourism Organization defines over tourism as the impact of tourism on a destination or parts thereof that excessively influences perceived quality of life of citizens and or quality of visitor experiences in a negative way. 
We believe over tourism is what is occurring in this community. Next slide, please. The following are photos that were taken just this past year in 2020, but are very typical for, I'd say the last several years. This one is an every weekend example of what we experienced, that last one, <laughs> roughly nine to 4 p.m. The continuous unloading of watercraft by the public and outfitters, blowing up of rafts, blocking of the emergency entrance to the trail river access, which is a huge concern. Next slide, please. This is a full parking lot with parking and unloading, blocking the entrance to the parking lot. Next slide, please. Parking all the way up Forbes, including drop off uh, and unloading on driveways. Now, sadly, there's an overwhelming sense of entitlement that we have frequently encountered from visitors in the last few years. Next slide, please. Well, this is a sad one for me. This photo is an indication of the watercraft that has become popular and now invades this natural heritage river. Next slide. The parking lot signage indicates closed at dusk and it was once patrolled uh, by GRCA and ticketed by GRCA, but this is no longer their practice allowing after hours parking both there and on our street. Next slide, please. This is parking on a very narrow Kirk Street, which does constrict tra traffic flow. Next slide. And this map indicates the areas in this small community which are affected by parking at peak times, which is a very large percentage of our streets. Next slide, please. So for myself, having been born and raised a few kilometers from the Glen, and my husband and I have lived and raised a family for 42 years on this street, I am rooted and invested in this amazing community. We have been involved, supportive, and yes, with some concerns since 1994 when the GRCA opened the railway, rail trail and parking lot. Again, there is so much more to this history than what is listed below. But the bottom line is that we, our community and visitors alike should be able to enjoy this wonderful natural environment as opposed to the community wide parking lot and amusement attraction it has become. And so truly everyone, we have had enough. Next slide, please. Thank you, Karen. The elephant in the room is obviously population and growth over the next decade. Um, we need to plan ahead. And looking at the population of the county relative to areas to the north and to the east, we're comparatively small. For instance, Waterloo region and Hamilton region each have a population of over half a million. The core of the Golden Horseshoe has a population of just under 8 million, which is expected to grow over the next 10 years to approximately 3.5 million. What we're saying is that we need to deal with this now. Next slide, please. If I take a second and I stop and consider what other communities are doing, uh, we look, we've looked at the township of North Frontenac and for over 20 years, they have managed an online permit system for campsites and road access. That money goes back into maintaining those campsites and those roads. It's as simple as paying online and writing the permit number on a piece of paper and placing it in your windshield. Northern Bruce Peninsula is a community that is very much based on tourism, where one newspaper quotes, over tourism is overwhelming. Problems include excessive traffic and parked vehicles and the issues that go with that. Their current solution is a combination of no parking, paid parking, and a resident parking pass. In Tiny Township, they've had uh, problems with overflow parking lots, overflowing parking lots, and the issues that go with that. As such, they have increased parking fines and have implemented parking permits that benefit res residents. Lowville Park in Halton Region has had limited parking due to construction, and they are using an online reservation system for booking three-hour visits and enforcing no on-street parking. Rockwood also has a problem with tourist parking in residential areas. They're currently working on a solution 
uh, the current council is uh, considering parking restrictions, but they don't uh, want to remove any parking uh, for residents. Uh, nearby at Spencer Gorge, which includes Webster's Falls, Two's Falls, and Dundas Peak. The problems they are facing are similar to ours. Too many people, driveways blocked, and the other symptoms that go along with over tourism. Many solutions have been attempted over the years, including a shuttle bus. Their current solution, which started last September, include implementing hefty parking fines and an online reservation system where visitors can book parking spots for two hours. The outcome, and although it's uh, it was just in the fall, has resulted in less cars, less people, no buses, no walk-ins, and 73% fewer tickets. Next slide, please. So with uh, strong support from our community, we are proposing a permitted resident parking system, which we are recommending be implemented seasonally from May 1st to November 1st on several streets, including but not limited to Forbes Street, Princess Street, and Dunbar Street. We're also requesting no parking on Kirk Street. Furthermore, we appreciate well-placed and effective signage. However, with over 20 signs added in the last eight years, we would really like to remove signs that were added last year and reconsider reducing all of the other signs. Lastly, we have been working with Councillor McAlpine on honing our proposal, and we are aware that there is a motion being brought forth tonight. As such, we are in support of the motion and look forward to working constructively with the county. Thank you very much. Okay, that's, are you going to speak to this slide or that's it for your presentation? Uh, that's it. I just, uh, I've got about a minute left. Um, I'd like to leave the proposal on, but if you guys have any questions regarding the last two slides, um, Karen and I would, would be happy to answer those as well. But this is okay. what we're here for tonight. All right, perfect. Um, so... Unfortunately, we've got to take that down so I can see if anybody's, there we go. Um, any questions to the presentation? Councillor Wheat. Uh, it's not a question, but a comment, um, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I'd like to thank uh, Karen and uh, coming forward tonight, uh, Jeff, um, you're, you're the savior to my problems because this has been ongoing ever since I've been on council and it's getting worse and it will continue to get worse. I mentioned this at a couple of council meetings ago, the pandemic, the closure of the Blue Jays brought the people of Toronto. They found something cheaper and more enjoyable to do instead of going to the ballpark, they went down the Grand River. Uh, I'm encouraged Jeff by um, your kind words and also that you're in support of the recommendation coming forward tonight from um, Member Bell. And uh, thank you very much for your understanding. And even though it's been hectic for you, every time I went out there, you always welcome me with open arms and, and the same too for Mayor Bailey and uh, Member McAlpine when they went out there, you, you never yelled at us. You were so <laughs> we need to do something. And Karen, you can sing us a song sometime. <laughs> Some other day, John. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, any other questions? Councillor McAlpine, then Councillor Bell. I was just gonna echo what John said. It, uh, yeah, I really have appreciated worth it, working with Jeff Leader and Karen, and I really do think that we need to do something more than what was proposed. And I'm fully endorsing the <clears throat> proposal coming forward that we've been working with John Bell on, and hopefully the rest of council will support it as well. Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, firstly, thanks to Karen and Jeff for bringing this forward. I know Jeff brought it a while ago. and We've perhaps been a little slow responding, but it's not because we weren't thinking about it. Uh, you brought forward an issue that impacts the residents of Glen Morris, but it, it's much wider than that. Mm -hmm. It's more than just parking in Glen Morris. Yes. It's an issue that uh, has become more obvious as demand, particularly fueled by uh, COVID recently, that has grown dramatically. Uh, to the point where, as Karen says, we've had enough. Well, I live at the other end of the, the trail, so to speak. I live close to Paris Penman's Dam. Uh, and I walk past Paris Penman's Dam every day. And in the summer, to describe it as chaotic and uh, inherently dangerous is a bit of an understatement. The sight lines on the corner where Willow Street turns from north-south 
to west east they're completely gone and, and people wander in and out between parked cars mm -hmm. from one side of the road to the other people unload their uh, kayaks and canoes over the fence on the north side of the railway bridge not even at the portage area it's a wonder we haven't had serious collisions and accidents so th there are some additional issues such as antisocial behavior of some river users. And you rem may remember the issue we had at Bean Park last year. Um, the picture that Jeff and Karen showed of the river craft, well, that's perhaps an extreme description of it. I mean, they're better suited for the swimming pool or the pool in the back garden than the river. Uh, and if you have ever watched these people come down the river, some of these big rafts are actually just means of carrying cases of alcohol. That's right. And other things. And so by the time they reach our end of the river, they're pretty merry. They're pretty, pretty happy about things. Um, so I think some of the issues we know are within our jurisdiction uh, and some are not, uh, but parking very definitely is. And as Jeff mentioned, it can be an effective way of control. So I'd like to bring forward a motion that, that asks staff to take one committee cycle to consider the proposals made by the delegation, but widen the proposal to include Paris, Penman's Dam and Bean Park. Why one committee cycle? Well, you can see the weather's already improving. In a month from now, people will be on the river. In two months from now, they'll be you know, heading towards peak, peak numbers. And I think we need to act quickly if we're to avoid an escalation of the problems that we saw last year, and as Karen mentioned, have been there for some years. So the motion also needs to recognize an enforcement aspect arising from potential new bylaws, but also the opportunity to use the technology that Jeff was talking about to limit and control the parking at river access and egress points. We're not alone, as Jeff showed, there are six or seven different places already working at it. And I hope that my colleagues on the uh, committee here will be supportive of the motion we put forward. This is not a guarantee that anything will happen. It should be a guarantee that we will consider something will happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, support the motion. And what I would suggest is that we also address in the staff report bylaw enforcement for violators of the parking rules because until we do that it sounds like they're parking wherever even though we have all these signs out there mm -hmm. so we need um, to have our bylaw officers out there on weekends i think we had suggested that for bean park a number of years ago when we had all those issues at bean park I haven't heard from those residents since. So I assume that whatever we did at Bean Park is helping, but I, I think the enforcement is a key um, measure that we need to take as well. So that's, I hope staff will look at that and bring it back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, uh, Mayor Bailey, I'll get I'll get to you in just one second here. So, is there any more questions to the presentation? Um, if there's not, and we're going to speak more to the motion that's coming forth, I think what I want to have is I want to have Councillor Bell uh, present the motion. We'll get a seconder for it, and then we can talk to the motion because I think that's where the conversation's going here, and I want to make sure that motion's on the floor before we start speaking to it. So, are there any other questions to the presentation specifically? Okay, um, so what I'm going to do, Councillor Bell, I'm going to look to you if you would like to read through your motion, get it on the table with a seconder, and then we'll proceed from there. Okay, it's a fairly long one, so apologies for that. Uh, whereas overflow parking from recreational Grand River tourism impacts several streets in the village of Glen Morris and areas around Bean Park and Penman's Dam in Paris and results in del deleterious impacts to local residents, and whereas sufficient access to the Grand River consistent with available public parking should be maintained, 
be it resolved that staff be directed to develop a more appropriate parking system, including potential for both a seasonal residential parking permit system and drop-off stroke pick-up pick facilities combined with remote parking. For the areas mentioned above, and to bring it back to this committee for consideration in April with the intention and subject to council approval at the end of April to introduce the system for the 2021 system season, which runs from May 1st to October 30th. And that appropriate bylaws to control the operation of the parking system be introduced and that staff be directed in order to develop a more appropriate parking system including potential for a 2022 budget consideration and implementation of an e-booking system for the 2022 season. Such a system would enable the public to research in advance the availability of parking or be directed to such other available locations for river access and parking and reserve such rights to better manage the resources of the County of Brant. Sorry, it's very long. No, I appreciate that and it, uh, it may have been a long one but it's important and it was it was well written and well read so appreciate you doing that um councillor mcalpine were you seconding the motion we seconds well i was yeah yeah okay um councillor that's, bell that's councillor mcalpine who wants to speak to the motion now mr mayor uh did you have something to the motion no i'm i'm fine thank you okay speaking to the motion councillor laferriere then councillor house yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, through to the rest of Council. Um, I, I think this is exactly what we were hoping to continue to do with the uh, RSVP plan. I plan on supporting the motion. I think that was a good first step when we sort of realized the, the tourist crisis, the over-tourism crisis that we were dealing with uh, initially. But then we, we were saying then, and when that report came back, that we needed to then take further steps in the future. We needed to... Um, um, make sure that things were, were built for the communities that they're they're put in and kind of going into that next layer. And I see this as a really good next next step. I remember Councillor McAlpine specifically talking about some of these measures and uh, I hope I hope we uh, we see good results. And I have a feeling based on conversations I've had with Jeff online that we will get good um, qualitative feedback about how this does and doesn't work and we can continue to tweak as needed. So fully supportive. Thank you, Councillor House, And then Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, yeah, I, I support this. I, I, I think there are some important creative solutions that can be used. And, and, and I, I think there's an opportunity to, to use um, charging for the premium parking areas for visitors uh, as, as a mechanism, not, not to make it a cash cow for us, but to make it a mechanism for, for maybe reducing the volume of users. If it's $20 to park your car, there um, in the better parking spot, as opposed to parking for free on a 10 minute walk away at the, the community center. Um, I, I think there's some mechanisms there that we can use to help reduce the numbers. Um, for for the, you know, the outfitters around town, I think it's 40 or 50 bucks. Um, you, you pay an outfitter, they transport you. They, they use their own access routes to the river they they take care of everything and and if 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 I, th I think people coming from toronto will pay 20 bucks to park their car in an easy spot and and to use the river but but for those who who will say i might as well pay 50 and pay an outfitter to go down the river well that's that's a solution that helps reduce the volume in glen morris too so i i think there's a lot of opportunities to improve this situation thank you councillor gatward and then councillor mcalpine to the motion Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And my question is, um, should we be adding in, I was disturbed to hear about the alcohol on the Glen Morris residents nodding their heads that, yeah, this is happening. Oh, yeah. Should we be adding that, and Brant County um, Council is, um, happy to lend our fire Paris fire boat to the OPP for enforcement issues on the river because our local detachment does not have a boat. And maybe that if a few weekends um, 
the word got out, oh, you can't drink on the river anymore because the OPP are out there, that might help solve that. I would rather see them out there doing enforcement than rescue or recovery because of abuse of alcohol. And they shouldn't be operating a watercraft and drinking anyway. It's against well, I, the law. You're absolutely right on that, Council Gatward, and, and I think it goes without saying that we'd, we'd much rather have the have them out there doing enforcement. But I'm just not too sure if the OPP are able to use the 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 fireman's boat and that sort of thing. I'm not sure that can happen. But at any rate, um, I think we need to look into it. I think that's something that we can come back with the the staff report to to tell us that. But I'm I'm not sure of that. Anything else if, to the? If I might, Mr. Chair, just to follow up with you. They do have a Marine division, the OPP, former staff and, and former staff sergeant Jim Milson was an expert Marine officer, but he's retired now. But they have other officers that could be loaned to Brant to perform that function or train some of our officers to operate the boat on the river according to their regulations. I so I think we, it's doable. Yeah, and I do understand that there has been OPP presence at the launching points to the river in the past, so that may be a, a way towards it as well. Uh, Councillor right. McAlpine. Well, I was just going to say that I was in support of Steve's suggestion, and uh, if John Bell was uh, in favor of adding the concept of the paid parking uh, for that area for the premium spots, the other advantage of having that is then we would have staff there full time that would also be able to direct people to the unused parking and uh, that would also help alleviate some of the uh, overuse. In the meantime, until we could bring in the online reservation system, which I think would be a, a preferred goal in the long run. So I just... Well, I think like within the motion, it does state to direct staff to develop a more appropriate parking system. So I think they can come back with right. some, with uh, several different options i would i would assume right. they always do so they'll come back with some options and then we can go from there okay does that sound fair yep no that's fair sounds yeah anything else to the motion okay uh seeing none we do have a motion on the floor it has been seconded all those in favor of the motion opposed okay that is carried so Jeff and Karen, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, that motion will go off to staff and it'll come back within the cycle and then we will go from there with what the options are. Thank you very much for the opportunity, everyone. It was great. Thank you. Yes, thank you everybody. Good night. Okay, moving on in the agenda to number five, the adoption of the previous minutes. Can I get a mover to adopt the previous minutes? Councillor Howes, Councillor Miller, any questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Carried? Any business arising from those minutes? Councillor Gatward. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let council know, I did check with MPP Booma about why they were closing the fire college. And he basically said, even though it's a state-of-the-art facility, I'm told. Nobody was using it. Yeah, that so that's a, shame. that's a shame. Maybe some of the smaller municipalities were using it, but I guess it wasn't enough to warrant keeping it open. So that was the response I got from um, MPP Booma. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that update. Any other business arising from the previous minutes? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to uh, number seven. There's a couple uh, consent items to be approved. Uh, we'll start with 7.1.1, uh, RPT-2155, the St. George Water, sorry, the St. George Wastewater Servicing Municipal Class Environment Assessment. Can we get a mover to get it on the floor? Councillor Coleman, Councillor Bell. Do we have some discussion on this? Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple of questions for staff. I noticed that the uh, capacity is nearly 4,000 cubic meters per day, when today we're at 1,000. I thought we were doubling capacity, not quadrupling it. So that's one question. 
a related question, I think uh, the cost estimate is now 34 and a half million, whereas in our recent five year budget um, submission just a couple of months ago, it was only 20.3. So could somebody explain what's happened and how we deal with that gap of what would be nearly $14 million? Thank you. Okay, I see General Manager Walton's come on. He wants to speak to that. Through the chair to uh, Councillor uh, Bell. Um, I'm not sure um, the proposal for the um, capacity of this at 3,900 cubic meters has been the consistent uh, um, projection throughout the, throughout the, the study. Um, the population of, of St. George is proposed to basically quadruple uh, via this plan. Um, with respect to the budgetary, um, I'll have to go back and, and check that and, and, uh, and bring further information on that back to council. Um, certainly this project is some time away and uh, um, it is likely in the, uh, as council will hear in, in other upcoming reports, it is likely that we'll have to be looking at the development charges uh, um, probably ahead of the five year um, 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 anniversary date where it would expire anyway. So the, through the upcoming budgets and the um, the upcoming uh, review of the development charges that, that um, those changes will need to be made. Councillor Bell, follow up. You're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Rob, for that answer. Um, I had a, a question which would have, it's actually more of a function of people in Paris. I noticed that we're going to ship solids from um, from St. George to Paris. Are we going to have a significant increase in the number of trucks per day going into Paris? Through, through the chair to Councillor Bell, that actual material is actually already being shipped to Paris. Now there will be a change in that as we do this, but uh, I don't believe that there'll necessarily be a big change because the process of what we're doing is gonna be a little different than what's happening right now. So. Um, uh, I don't know the actual answer to this in, in the number of trucks, but it is a different process there. So we can provide more information on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody else with questions to the report? Councillor Miller, then Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have a few questions, so just uh, cut me off when you've heard enough. Um, first question, uh, do we know how much this studies cost with all the overages over the years? Did we ever get a full accounting of that? Um, through the chair to Councillor Miller, I, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Sorry. Can we get that information, please? Yeah. Yes, you can. Um, second question. Page eight of the report, page fifty-seven, our package says effluent shall be sampled and analyzed once every three months for the first three years. If everything's good, it can we can stop that. My question is. Um, I, <laughs> I, I don't understand that because if you're sampling at the start of the first three years, um, wouldn't the development kind of follow after that? Y in other words, you build it, then the development starts. What I, I'm wondering if um, maybe through you, Mr. Chair, Rob, can you explain why you would start, you would do only the first three years? Why wouldn't you do the first five years or, or start after the first year or something like that? What, Explain why my logic's wrong on that one. Through the chair to, to Councillor Miller. Um, first of all, we don't have a, the updated um, environmental compliance approval yet, so we don't know what the, the actual um, requirements of the ministry will be yet. There will always be ongoing uh, um, um, processes for, um, for sampling required. Um, what will happen is, is that um, for the first period of time, you'll have a, an uh, an increased program to do more. And then based on that, um, the, they'll, it'll be, um, it'll be shifted after that. So um, we don't actually even have the ECA yet. We'll be approving, applying for that after we um, have the design done. So this is a proposal in the consulting, uh, in the consultants um, um, report, which will be updated when the ministry actually approves the construction of the new plant. Um, Mr. Chair, I think, I think it would have been nice if the consultant came and talked about it, given how much we, you know, Paid for the study over the years. Um, next question: the effluent parameters, as uh, Councillor Bell pointed out, we're going. It's almost a fourfold increase. Um, 
and, and in there, page seven of the report again talks about the effluent parameters. Um, what happens if we exceed those parameters? What 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 do we do? What's the plan? And, and I know that that'll come later, maybe you say in the ECA, but if you spend all this money in, in what you're asking us to support and <laughs> we exceed those effluent parameters as laid out on page seven, what what happens? Through the chair to uh, Councillor Miller. Um, this is just like the ECA we have, um, or the environmental compliance approval we have on any of our plants. All of our plants have um, effluent criteria on them. And the ministry um, reviews our annual reports and uh, they have inspections. And um, if we are not in compliance with, with some of these um, um, effluent criteria, they can put orders on us to, to make improvements. Um, that's what, what could happen. Um, when you run a, a wastewater treatment plant, it's a, you know, it's a biological process. You can have issues which happen, which disrupts that. And you can have things go out of compliance for short periods of time. That, that's not an unusual thing to happen. And usually you work with the ministry and uh, explain to them what happened. If you have long standing um, issues, um, you need to change your processes. And that's what would happen as you would work on in improving the processes in the plant to make sure that you didn't have the, the exceedances. But the ministry can put orders on you and they can put fines on you if you don't meet your, your ECA. Okay, thank you, Rep. Um, last question, um, and, and I apologize for the length of this one, but I'm trying to get to the end result. And maybe through you, Mr. Chair, Rob, you could explain the next steps. Because again, you're asking us to support, you know, this process, and I know this is the first step of, 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 of this process to, to go and spend tens of millions of dollars, <laughs> but it seems to me that this solution that SEMA has arrived at is based on um, what they talk about, page 13 of our report, multiple technology solutions that can achieve the anticipated effluent limits are available. And what we've seen in our, our package, we, we they certainly didn't get into what these multiple technology solutions are. And did they rely on these solutions, which we have no idea what they are, to get at their final design, which is expand the current site? In other words, could we have gotten by with another solution? And I'll just throw one out, um, say the pipeline to the Grand River. That's just an example. But could there have been another solution if we didn't rely on these quote technology solutions. And, and so what I'm getting at is, will we be able to see maybe the, so the how it's going to operate before we, we proceed, you know, for tens of millions of dollars. And the reason I'm asking is that is because right now we're being asked to spend tens of millions of dollars on the capital costs. And what I'm getting at is the way this plant is operated, it comes down to, the operating costs. So we're, are, are these solutions that we're talking about, um, do they have higher, for example, operating costs than maybe another model? Um, that's one concern I might have, well, I do have. And then uh, talking about chemicals or consumables, um, do they use more than other processes? And are these chemicals or consumables that say this treatment plant is going to be used for these high tech solutions? Um, are, are they available locally or do we got to rely on a, a, a 4,000 mile supply chain or longer from, from China or something like that? So I guess in a roundabout way is <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, yes, this is the first step, but what's the next step? Like, when do we get into those kind of details? Like, I'll keep it at a higher level, but, but you see where I'm going. I have concerns about, about those kinds of things. And I'm just wondering uh, before, proceeding to, to, to write big bigger and bigger checks when 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 will we when will we have that information in front of us through the chair to uh, councillor miller so the process going forward is what uh, is being asked tonight is for council to accept this report and put it out for a 30-day or more public mm -hmm. review actually the public review we're proposing is more than 30 days so a minimum 30-day public review during that period of time any uh, parties uh, impacted by this can uh, bring forward concerns and we have to deal with those concerns uh, before the public review period is done. So that's the first step. The next step would be for us to hire a consultant, 
to do the actual design of the plant. That's where we would get into the details of which technology we're going to use. Now, I wasn't here uh, at Brant County when you started this um, um, project, but my understanding is that the way the study was done here, and they work with Infrastructure Ontario on this, is that they weren't going to um, um, detail the actual technology for this plant in the report. They're going to consider alternative ones and possibly do a design build um, or design build operate for this plant as, as the actual um, outcome of this, this project. I think that we've changed our mind on that. I don't believe that we'll go in that direction. We certainly do need to pick the technology and then, and then council will get to see that before it, uh, before it goes out uh, um, for tender and for, for final design. One thing though, just to note back into, into the comments you made, through the EA process, the, the alternative going to the Grand River was looked at and that was not, that was not ruled the, the preferable way to go at this time. So the preferable way to go is to use Fairchild Creek as the outlet to increase the capacity of 3,900 cubic meters and to choose a technology that will meet the effluent criteria that are set out in that report. And there are a couple of technologies that will do this. Um, certainly I'll use one example of one of membrane technology is one that likely will be a great consideration in this, uh, in this, uh, in this design. And I don't think you need to worry so much about the chemicals for that. It's, uh, it's what the energy costs will be. And then we'll, we will be looking at the life cycle costs of that as we choose that technology and, and, the op and look at the operation costs. So um, Councillor Miller, you can be uh, um, guaranteed that I share some of the concerns with you. Operating costs of these plants, um, it often over the life cycle uh, exceeds the, um, the, that capital cost. The 34.6 seems like a lot of money. Um, the operating costs over a long period of time will exceed that. So we have to be very concerned that we build something here that is cost effective to, uh, to operate. And then it's on the top of our radar. And, um, and I think I've, I think I've covered off the rest of your question there. <clears throat> Councilor Miller, you're good with that. Well, <laughs> I'm okay for the vote tonight, but yeah, I, like I said, I, I do have a lot of concerns. There's a lot of information we don't have. And I understand um, it, it is a process, but uh I guess one step at a time and just, just keep us informed about what's going on. So uh, we'll, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Rob. Thank that's you. what I was going to say. This is just uh, the first step here. Let's get through this one and then uh, and more information on the next one. Okay. Uh, Councillor Gatward and then Councillor Weed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you to Rob, the 30 point some odd million dollars. Can you tell me how they arrived at that number? They must have had some sort of idea as to costs for this and that and to come up with that number, especially since it's way over budget. And the other thing I wanted to know is, um, Councillor Bell mentioned about twinning or he thought it was doubling the plant and um, that term had come up before long ago about twinning the treatment plant. Um, is the building just being doubled in size yet the capacity is quadruple? Is that where that came from? And I'm happy to hear in the report that we have enough land. So I just need answers for those two things, please. Mr. Walton. So through the, through the chair to Councillor Goward, um, the cost estimates we're done here were based on um, conceptual design and uh, and uh, our consultant's estimate of what those conceptual designs are. And um, that, that happens on every EA. When you're doing an EA, you never have a, a fully engineered project. So you never have an actual cost estimate. The cost estimates are developed as, as you go along. And our project like this, you really never have the total cost estimate till it's done. You know, at the end of the contract, you know what it actually costs. As you go on, you, you get closer to that as you go along. So at an EA, um, you know, we're at a, a cost estimate of, um, you, know, um, you know, plus or minus 25% probably is, is what the, you, would, you would actually deem the, the accuracy of that cost estimate because you haven't got actual engineered drawings. They have conceptual designs and they're using their, their expertise on that. So, um, so that's what that's based on. Um, as far as what we're doing at the plant, um, it's sort of hard to describe because we're putting in a new process here. The process that we're extending out here to get the effluent quality we're talking about 
is not doubling of anything because we're going to put new processes in place. So we're totally rebuilding this plant and then reusing, the, we'll be re, rebuilding what's there to use the new processes too. So it's, there's no real concept of how, you know, it's not, this isn't a simple doubling and using the same process. We're going to a different process here. So it's sort of hard to describe how, you, how, how you're going to do that. And, and the site is relatively tight, although it, it should, it, it's going to fit what we need to do. Um, one of the beauties of some of the new technologies like a membrane, which I mentioned before, is they actually use a very fairly small footprint. Um, they are expensive, but they use a small footprint. It certainly isn't technology that, it certainly is technology that is well used now, both in water and wastewater. So um, I think we can be confident in that and, and actually estimating what the, the operational cost should be uh, relatively, uh, um, relatively good as we go along doing the final design as well. I hope that answered your, Thank answered you. your questions. Yeah, so the footprint for the building isn't going to change that much, is what you're saying. It's just that the process inside that building will be more new technology and more efficient and not take up as much space. Through the chair to Councillor Gallagher. Actually, we're building new buildings and then repurposing the existing one. So, oh, so there's okay, going to be thank more, you. Tankage, more tankage. In, in a wastewater treatment plant, it's the tankage that's really the big thing. And, uh, um, and the, the equipment that you put in all of this, um, you know, the buildings here aren't gonna be really that big. It's all the tankage and whatever, so thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wheat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rob. Uh, this report is just a start. This has been seven years I've been waiting for this. So I'm in support of it because this is far from the finished product. This is just a start. Okay, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we do have a recommendation on the floor with a seconder. So I will call the vote. All those in favor of the recommendation. Opposed? That is carried. Moving on to 712 RPT-21-56, the award of tenders. Can I get a mover? Councillor Coleman, Mayor Bailey, any questions? No questions to this. Um, I, I do have one question myself. I know as chair, we're not really supposed to, but one question I do have on this. I'm curious, is it normal to only have one submission? Through the chair to the chair. Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't think that that's unusual in this type of equipment. I think there really are only two suppliers of this, this type of equipment and, and to only get one is not unusual. Okay. That's a good answer. All right, uh, no other questions. I will call the vote all those in favor. Opposed? Carried. Okay, now we will move on to 713, RPT-21-67, land transfers of 170 trillion. Can I get a mover for that? Councillor LaFerriere, Councillor Bell, do we have questions for this? Councillor Howes. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I, I support the land transfer recommendation. Um, and since it relates to future plans for the Trillium property, as mentioned in the first line, uh, now is as good a time as any to ask the city of Brantford to confirm their plans for expansion of the Trillium housing project. Several months ago, our council unanimously showed commitment to the project, including our financial involvement. And I recall there was talk of a feasibility study and a grant application or two, but we've not heard the outcome of those initiatives lately. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if this inquiry should be directed to staff or to our council representatives on the social services committee. Um, perhaps the CAO could weigh in on that. Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and through you, uh, what, what I can note is, is I believe the, uh, the, from what I've understood, the uh, feasibility study work is underway. I don't quite know the status of it. I'm not sure what the, I know a grant application was made uh, for the trillion project. And I don't know what the status of that is either. So it might be uh, better directed to the, uh, the members of the uh, social service and housing uh, representatives uh, 
for that shared service and perhaps they could bring it up there and get city staff to update on that. So. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Howes, you're good with that? Yeah, thank you very much. All right, so we'll make sure that's probably, when is the next meeting? First Wednesday of the month. Okay. So we'll leave that to be brought up at that meeting for an answer and that would be appreciated. Um, is that it for you, Mr. Howes? Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion's carried. We will move on to 714 RPT-21-73, 143 Oakland Road, surplus declaration. Can I get a mover? Councilor Gatwer, can I get a seconder? Mayor Bailey, any questions to this one? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Moving on to 7.1.5, RPT-21-75 for the Cedar Street Class Environmental Assessment Project for approval. Can I get a mover, please? Councillor Bell, seconder. Councillor McAlpine, any questions on this? Councillor Bell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to staff. I'm glad to see this is coming forward and mm -hmm. I presume that we are on track for the commencement of construction in May or June. Could somebody confirm that, please? General Manager Walton, you can speak to that. To the Chair, to Councillor Bell. Um, as outlined in the report, um, we're well on our way with our design. We, we clearly need to do a couple things on this. We need to complete the, the, 30, the, the public review of the, the solution. Uh, we need to uh, complete our easement deal for the, the, the proposed easement to get across the Rest Acres Road. Um, and as noted in here, to do that construction, um, we actually have to finish the last part of an archaeological um, study, which we can't do in the middle of the winter. Um, so that we should be able to be on that soon. Um, as noted um, in here, though, the south part of this uh, project um, doesn't require the EA to be done at all. And we will uh, be working towards a, a, a tender on that with provision for the rest of it. So um, uh, we're doing our best to make this go forward. Um, this summer and and uh, we as I say we've got a couple of uh, hiccups here to, to to overcome but we're we're working our way through um through them. That's good news. Any other questions to this? Councillor Gatward. Um, just something Rob just uh, said. Didn't the um, developers on Cedar Street? all have to do archeological studies. And if they passed muster, why does the county have to do one? Mr. Walton? Through you, Mr. Chair to Councillor Goward, all of the, all of the archeological studies are site specific. So this, this particular one, we've got to do the, the next stage of it is actually on the property where we proposed to the easement where there has been no archeological done before. Oh, it's just for the easement. Thank right. you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Moving on to 7.1.6 is RPT-21-76, the Community Improvement Plan application for BUR-2101. Can I get a mover? Councillor McAlpine, seconder. Councillor Miller, any questions on this report? Okay, seeing none, everybody's good with the recommendation. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Okay, last one, 717 RPT-21-81, Burford Cenotaph repairs. There is a recommendation. Can I get a mover, please? Councilor Chambers, seconder, Mayor Bailey, any questions to this report? Councilor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I just um, wanted to say that um, Miss Ballantyne, the director of Parks and Facilities, did an excellent job. I don't know who the contractor is she used to repair the monument in Oakland, but it's similar to the Burford one. So if we could get the same people, it would be done very well. That's all I want to say. Anything else? Seeing none, all in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? That is carried. Okay, that's everything to be approved. Uh, we do have three items to be received. I'd like to put them all together unless somebody wants one pulled. Anybody want one pulled? Okay, that said, we're gonna do 7.2.1, 7.2.2 and 7.2.3, all as one motion. Can I get a mover? Councillor Howes, Councillor Bell. Any questions to any of them? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Staff reports, 8.1. We do have a recommendation, RPT-21-54 for the water and wastewater rate structures from 2021 to 2025. Can I get a mover? Councillor Coleman, seconder? Councillor McAlpine, questions? Councillor Bell, then Councillor Gatward. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I have uh, comments which end up in questions. Do you want me to do it now or after question after the question round? Does anybody have any questions, specific questions? Councillor Gatward, what is your question? You're on mute, Councillor. Thank you. On page one, um, Tier four, um, if you're using 100 cubic meters plus in a month, you get the reasonable rate. So somebody that has got their usage up to 97 cubic meters, and they say, oh, well, I might as well turn on the tap and use up those extra three cubic meters so that I can get the cheap rate. I don't know if I agree with tier four. I, I think it should be, for lack of a better word, tier four should be tiered billing, like the first 50 or 45 cubic meters, they pay the same as other people. And then after that, give them a little bit of a discount. Um, I, I believe that's how it is, Councillor Gatwer, but can somebody confirm that? I believe it's, it's if they hit the 100 mark, it's anything over the 100 that they would get that rate on. But uh, General Manager Walton, can you confirm that? Um, through the chair to uh, Councillor Gatwer, that's exactly the way it works. So it's calculated through the, through the tiers. So for 0 to 15, you pay the, the, the initial. Then it goes up for the next year, it goes up for the third tier. And for the fourth tier, it goes back down. So you do pay right through. So you don't get a discount on the first one because you went over. No, but the fourth tier, they do get a discount for the Only whole 100 cubic meters. No, they don't. Only for over 100 cubic meters. For the first 100, they'll oh. pay a certain rate. Anything over that, they would get, they the, get the, the reduced discount. rate. You good with that, Councillor? Okay. Yes. Okay. No other questions? Councillor Bell, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to uh, that as well. First of all, I want to thank Rob and Alex Davison and Robin Hewitt. They put up with my lists of concerns and they've been very helpful in providing background and information that has helped me to understand this. It's a big topic. And given that we're fixing rates now for four years, I think it's really important that we do our full due diligence tonight, because some of us, many of us may not actually be on council next time this comes around. So I don't want to miss this opportunity. And I appreciate the steps that, that Rob and, and co have taken since the first draft. You might not recognize it, but there are subtle changes 
since the first draft. The um, fixed charges for water have been further reduced. And because it's a zero sum game, then the variable charges have gone up a little. But despite all that, and I appreciate Rob and Alex and Robin trying to work towards an answer that I like, uh, I still have concerns and I will make a motion later to ask for further work and analysis over this next committee cycle. But as a bit of background and particularly for the viewers of this meeting and residents in general, in, in a recent comparative study by a major consulting company, the County of Brant is identified as having the highest water and wastewater charges of major Ontario municipalities. And that's a fact of life. This is unfortunately a consequence of the water supply and wastewater treatment system we have today. It's the hand we've been dealt. And as you recall from the discussion about St. George wastewater treatment plant, we don't change things overnight. That it's a long game on this. And I want to say that I have full confidence in our staff who do a first class job of operating, maintaining and developing the systems that we have. And they're caught between a rock and a hard place on this in terms of setting rates because it is a zero sum game. If I take from one part and give to another, somebody's going to pay. But given this background, I want my, my specific concerns. This, this study needs to address financial robustness. Uh, it needs to be efficient. It needs to be environmentally sustainable and it should be equitable. And on the first two items, I think we've done a great job. You know, we show a plan that meets, that, that provides revenues that meets the expenses that we need over the next four years. That's paramount. I think we're making progress towards environmental sustainability and the proposals that Rob has made in this latest draft for incentive to, re to residents to make uh, more efficient water, buy more efficient water appliances and features. But I remain concerned actually about equity in the proposal. So there's two elements of equity. The uh, current and proposed structure has inequities between residential and commercial customers. And perhaps most importantly to me, it disproportionately burdens very low volume users. And I'm using low volume users here as a very loose proxy for low income families. If we could apportion the, the, the shares of water costs on the basis of income, that would be a perfect solution, but we can't. The best practice advice is that users should not pay more than 5% of their after-tax income on water and wastewater. So for somebody that uses five cubic meters in our system, their bill is $85. $70 is fixed, $15 is variable. So if 5% is $85, then anybody that's not earning $1,700 a month after tax, I think is being hard pressed. And I'm sure they feel that way. And that's some of the feedback I've received. So let me go on a little more. The comparative data that IBI showed in about our resident, residential customers shows that we're paying more than the average of municipalities around us by about 25%. And that I understand because of the nature of our system. And I could live with that, except for the fact our commercial customers are being charged less than our, uh, uh, less than the average of municipalities around us. So there's an imbalance, which I'd like to see uh, rebalanced. There are a thousand customers out of about 8,000 who use less than five cubic meters a day. And I'm gonna call them low volume users. And they pay 74% of the average bill, which is based on about 15 cubic meters a month. In absolute terms, as I said, they pay about $85 a month. In Brantford and Cambridge, two next door neighboring municipalities, these low volume users pay 45 and 46% respectively of the average bill. And that's actually on a lower absolute number as well. So our lowest tier of users are disproportionately paying a larger contribution to the upkeep and operation of the system. So I made some suggestions to staff, including rebalancing of residential and commercial revenue streams and a reduction in the charges for the lowest volume users. I suggested a lower tier of fixed charges for those users 
taking less than five cubic meters a month to bring it in line with neighboring municipalities and paid for by increasing the tier four in the humpback rate structure proposal. So just taking up Joan's point, uh, the people operating beyond 100 cubic meters would not get the same rate as tier one. They would get a higher rate, which would then that extra revenue would be funneled back to the front end to make it a lower cost uh, situation for low volume users. Now, you sorry see, to interrupt you there, Councillor, but I'm going to let you go on a little bit, little bit longer here, and then we need a question. I'm almost done. Well, I've already given two questions, I think, but staff don't support these proposals, I, and I disagree with them. Uh, I would like to understand why we could not have a fixed, a tiered fixed charge, uh, even though it's not being used in Ontario, it has been used elsewhere. And I know that people feel, the staff feel this is going to complicate, but it's no more complex than a seasonal add-on for higher volume users. So I would like, my, one of my questions is, tell me why a, a, a lower fixed tier for low volume users cannot be accommodated. And my second question is, why can't we bring commercial and residential users into balance? So I'm gonna move a motion later that, that staff do further analysis and bring forward additional options and recommendations at our next meeting. And as they know full well, I'm more than happy to work with them. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So a couple of questions there, uh, General Manager Walton. Do you wanna to respond to those? Thank you, Mr. Chair to Councillor Bell. Um, one of the problems with the setting of the five cubic meters is, or any any amount as a as a threshold for how where you'd have a different rate, is that they, this can vary. You can have actually a lot of customers that are actually right around that rate, and one month they might be in, and one month they might be out. So when you have a meter size and you're fixing your fixed charge on that, you know, sort of equating customers alike that have a you know similar frontages and similar properties and whatever, you know, that that rate is fixed. If you do it as per what you use, the rate would vary, and it would be it would be um, in the I don't know whether the the um, billing systems actually could, as they're set up today, could actually handle it. So I don't know the answer to that, but it would be if it can handle it, it's a difficulty, and we would have complaints consistently of customers that if you're at five point one, you're going to pay a certain amount. If you're at four point nine, you're going to pay another amount. What is the difference between those customers? When you've got a meter size, it's it's fixed, and that is the as we've said, that is the practice in Ontario for um, for setting flat rates. Um, so that is one of the difficulties with that. The other difficulty, as um, as um, Councillor Bell pointed out, is that he used the number of a thousand. Um, I think it depends on the month. Um, it could be as high as fourteen to fifteen hundred customers in the zero to five cubic meters uh, per month. Uh, um, to transfer the cost reductions off that, if we make it substantial onto the ICI, which is what happens when you put it onto the high tier, really has a great impact there because you're going from those small number of customers to a few hundred customers on the other end of it. And it does have a dramatic impact there. We've done that analysis. We, we know what it is. Um, I think it's a, um, it's been talked of in some of the preamble to this in our, in our um, reports that we did to, to committee before. Um, so, one thing that did happen though, when we have done this 2% per year reduction in the fixed rate, it has transferred more onto the, onto the volumetric and that has changed that balance. That is, uh, as Councillor Bell noted that we were our, um, our residential customers were paying higher than the average and then the, the, um, the ICI were paying lower. That has, that has shifted with this. And, and anything that we do here on the residential where we transfer it and then put it on there, we've got way fewer resident or ICI customers. So it's exasperated or, ex or the changes happen exponentially when you make that change. So small changes on the one side become way bigger on the other when you transfer it to the smaller number of customers. So that, that, without getting into detailed calculations, that, that's the best I can answer that at this time. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Bell, you're good with that? You're on mute. Good. No, I'm not, not happy with that. I, I think we are still in the situation where we are uh, putting our residential customers at a uh, comparative disadvantage to uh, commercial customers. We are also putting our low volume users, and I, I admit it's a rough approximation to low income uh, families, but we are, drawing, we are putting a much heavier burden on them 
than, than we should be. Uh, it, it, is, it stands no comparison with our neighbors, and I believe it stands no comparison in, in absolute terms against the metric that is used in uh, social circles of 5% of uh, net income going towards water. So no, I'm not happy. And I would still want to make a motion that we ask our staff to go back and do everything they possibly can to bring commercial and residential into balance uh, and find a way to reduce the cost, fixed cost, particularly for low volume users. Um, Councillor Coleman, you had something? Yes, I do, uh, Mr. Chair. I have a comment, so I will, I'll wait after everybody else has done their questions. How's that? Okay. Uh, well, uh, we had some comments previously, so go ahead, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I, th I thought it was a great report, and, 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 and I'm not trying to argue with Councillor Bell, but how can you can't compare apples to oranges because our, our, our size of our municipality is totally different from our neighbors of, of the city of Brantford and the city of Cambridge for the amount of users that we have on our water system. We have five different water systems. If we had one water system su supporting all those municipalities that are on that, it would be a total different system. But it's a cooperative, and I, I support this, the way it is right now, and I think it was a good report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Councillor Ferrier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have a question at the end of this, um, but I, I guess uh, some some comments and by way of context, um, I don't I don't disagree with what Councillor Bell is is attempting or wanting to see. I, I think that's a very noble. Um, that said, I, I think it's it's interesting. This week I was or last week I was approached by a local small business owner who works with and and uh, Rob will know what I'm talking about here, but works with uh, and for uh, a consumer base that makes up some of the most underprivileged in our community that utilize water service, a service that is reliant on water from him. So I'm trying to be very vague here on purpose, but people may be able to put it together. And, you know, while this isn't the strongest argument, uh, if we overburden the, the group, the, the corporate group, this particular business will see a huge cost increase put on the consumer, which is the underprivileged group trying to be helped in this case. And you know it, it it is complex. As Councillor Coleman was stating, you know we do have these five systems. We the comparators are are tough because you know when we talk to people because people do come and they and you know this. You're you're everybody here's a gets this. We get lots of complaints about the fees, and I'm glad to see some of the costs are going to go down. But when you actually look at the comparators with other communities, they don't have five systems operating that are different types and different. Um, groupings, they don't have the same geography with a, a hole in the middle that we don't access, right? The spread of, of uh, water systems is pretty intense. And then we mix that with, we tend to have lower taxes than a lot of those neighboring communities. So when you look at the cost of the consumer to the municipality in terms of taxes mixed in with uh, fees for water, um, we actually are, are very comparable. Right, you'll see these other municipalities that are in uh, Councillor Bell's uh, matrix there, that they'll have lower water fees, but also much higher taxes. Um, so there's that's something to consider as well. That said, I, I think the purpose of trying to make sure that those folks who are most vulnerable economically have equity for water and affordability, and this is the question to staff, and it might not be to Rob, this might be a question to Cindy uh, or somebody else, but could we instead maybe look at an affordability grant system that doesn't affect all of this, but looks at the other side of individual users who might have an issue with some of these costs? You know, uh, is there a care and compassion fund? Like this is, these are things that other municipalities have done as well. And is that something that maybe we want to look at a report on how to, to deal with the person who truly, truly, truly is having a hard time affording uh, the water uh, the way it's structured or will be structured in the future? That's my question. General Manager Walton. Through you, through the chair to uh, Councillor Leferriere. Um, there already is a system in place through, through social services where the um, most vulnerable population can get assistance with, with fees like this. Um, it's, it's, there's not a great number of people that that, um, that, that that applies to, but we we can get help for people that that are um, are um, that do need um, um, assistance like that. There are actually in North America, lots of examples of other um, systems where they actually do have um, a grant system, as you mentioned, for affordability above and beyond what is, is already available here. Generally, those are um, funded by the tax system, not the rates. 
Mm -hmm. So you would, you know, through um, the budget, you would set a, a, an amount and you would say, this is available for that. And you would have people apply for it. Um, staff would certainly um, um, support that much more than trying to shift the, the, the burden through, um, uh, through the setting of the rates, which is we've said is very, this is a complex thing. And we're, we're, pro we're promoting a new rate here, which is to, um, you know, for several things to promote conservation, to promote, uh, promote uh, equitability, um, and those sort of things. And it's interesting, you know, a couple of businesses that we talked to here really appreciated the fact that we're, we're doing this for four years, that we could show them the impact for four years, what their impact was. And we've made some suggestions of how they can possibly go about reducing their burden by doing things with their own infrastructure. So I think we're going um, um, in some really good directions here. And, uh, you know, do, doing these last couple of things that some of it is really hard to do everything right and, and, and make everything work. And, and, you know, the last little piece of this, of, of these thousand customers or 14, 1500, whatever it is, shifting more off them onto the others, it becomes exponential when you put it onto the, onto the few users, which are, are at the, the top end of the, of the, of the usage uh, chain there. So um, there are ways that we could do this um, and we could certainly research and bring back information on that outside of the rates bylaw. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, if I can, just to comment on that, I, I think that some of the disconnect comes from the nature of our social service system being shared while our water and wastewater is not. And this becomes something where in order to do that through the city system may be overly complex and we may want to look at ways that we can do it in-house or at least have options. And yes, it would come through the tax base and come through budget, but you know, but, but maybe that's, a, that's at least something we should be looking at to get to the same place and it could be based on age or income or, or, or something but uh, I'd feel more comfortable doing that internally with us and I feel like the city probably would be as well because to ask them to do this when they don't have the same water rate issue uh, to the same degree may be, may be troublesome so thank you so much and, and appreciate it I do plan on supporting the report yeah that, that's a good point Councillor okay so I've got Councillor Miller and then I have Councillor Howes thank you Mr. Chair just um, <laughs> based on some of the comments and discussions going on Anybody that is hooked up to the public system never questions whether it's going to be turned on or not. It's always on. It's always safe. And that costs money, unfortunately. And the biggest driver of that is energy. And energy is only going up in price. So these price pressures, they're not going to get any simpler. So I don't agree um, with Councillor Bell suggesting that we turn this back to staff. I hope you rule that motion out of order. If he doesn't like it, he should vote against it rather than ask staff to look at it. We've already had a consultant come in. We paid the consultant, they've done a presentation. We've had multiple discussions. I think staff have done a wonderful job making this fair for everybody. And the, the low income water users, I understand there's issues, but I think there's also other avenues to deal with them. So I, I will support the, the motion when it comes up for a vote. Councillor Howes. Mm, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to say this is a comment, not a question. Um, I share Councillor Bell's concerns about this issue. Uh, and I, and I, I do completely understand that because of the geography of our municipality, we are go going to be on the high end of what it costs to deliver water. And I get that. And, and I'm happy to explain that to, to any, anybody who asks. At the same time, while we penalize the, the, the high usage residential user, the, the, the resident who wants their lawn to look like a golf course and they, they water it all summer long and it's their choice. And if they, you know, we, we apply a surcharge so that they pay more. Equally, I would like to see us have some kind of mechanism whereby if you're a micro user, you're, you're, our, you're half of tier one and, and there's apparently a thousand or fifteen hundred of them. That 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 that's that there's a mechanism for that that doesn't necessarily require that resident to phone the county and say, um, I, I, "I'm I'm in a challenging financial position and I'm 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 looking for for assistance." I, I, so I I I, I support uh, Councillor Bell's. Uh, approach and just just wondering if, if 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 we took one more cycle to look at this a little bit further if, if we might come up with with a, a a better solution thank you 
Okay, um, before I go to Councillor Gatward for the second time, is there anybody that has not spoken yet that, that wants to speak to this motion? Okay, um, before we get to you, Councillor Gatward, um, General Manager Walton, go ahead. Through you to uh, Mr. Chair to Council. Um, there is a problem with um, extending out this. Um, we would have to change <clears throat> the bylaw uh, da implementation date if we go further because we have to work with our service provider. It'll take about six weeks for them to actually implement the rates. So I, I just bring that up. It's not that we wouldn't do that, but it's that there is, it isn't that we can, we can't pass a bylaw in April and have it implemented May 1st. I just wanted everyone to know that. Oh, that's good information to have. Councillor Gatward for the last time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speaking to this fixed rate um, suggestion for low water users, certainly that would help um, low income people. However, it would also help people who go to Florida for four or five months because they wouldn't use any water and they would get the reduced rate. And all these reduced rates we have to remember are gonna impact other users because this is a user pay system. And it says on bottom of page 128 that staff are not recommending a tiered fixed rate for low volume consumers. And it would, it would cause a lot of upheaval in the billing system at the top of page 129. I believe Energy Plus still does our water billing and we may have to pay for a whole new billing system because this would be a whole different thing. Everybody's bill would be different all the time because it depends on how much water they used and and it, and it said it would be difficult, extremely difficult to administer. And I agree with that. That might drive costs up as well. And in the end result, everyone's going to pay for that. And yeah, we do have all the water systems, but as caretakers of the water system, council is responsible. We have to ensure that municipal water is there and safe. We don't want any issues like we had in Walkerton. And so unfortunately, yeah, even though it would be nice, I, I do, I, I can't support that lower for five cubic meter customers. They have that convenience and that they have it even when they go to Florida, if they don't shut their water off. So Mrs. Brown can come and water their plants. I, I, um, I support the report. Okay. All right. So we've had a lot of good discussion here. There is a motion on the table and it has been seconded. Councillor Bell, I know you have a separate motion that you would like to uh, to put on here. Um, I think we need to understand what's going to happen with this first motion. If it does not go through, then we can bring your motion to the table and go from there. So there is, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A question of process. Am I not allowed to amend the current motion? There, there can be an amendment to it if the mover and the seconder uh, and you get a seconder and they are they are okay with it as a friendly amendment. So your friendly amendment, you're, you're wanting staff to take it back, review things again. That's, that's correct. I would like to take one more cycle uh, with a focus on balancing commercial and residential uh, revenues and also finding a way to uh, make it more affordable for our low volume users. Bearing in mind, this is a zero sum game. I'm not trying to reduce the amount of money in the system. It's about who pays what. And right now, commercial customers pay less and residential customers pay more, relatively speaking. And we have a group of people who are challenged to pay the low rate and the low volume that they use. Okay. So is there a seconder to that amendment? Okay, Councillor Howell. Now, um, Adam, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to rely on you here. Who was the original mover and the seconder? The original mover was Councillor Coleman and the original seconder was Councillor McAlpine. 
Okay. Okay. So we've got an amendment that's on the floor. It has been seconded. So we are going to vote on the amendment only at this point in time. Is there all in favor of the amendment? Opposed? Okay, so the amendment is defeated. We will go back to the original motion that is on the table by Councillor Coleman and Councillor McAlpine. Uh, the recommendation that is written. All in favor of the original recommendation? Opposed? Recommendation is carried. Okay, we're going to move on to 8.2. Um, RPT-21-70, the Lawn Pardon? Bowling Clubs. Point of, point of, oh. point of order? Or, so or possibly point of, point of information. Are, are we able to, to ask staff around the, the rebate piece? I know we've done it informally, but can we do that officially or do we need to do that officially to get a report around a potential rebate for low volume users uh, or recommendations thereof? Or will staff just take that under advisement based on the conversation? My have? understanding from Mr. Walton earlier, there is that is available. But do we need to formalize wanting to do that at this? General time? Manager Walton. Are you Mr. Chair to Councilor Leferrier? Um, through the recommendations in this report, we did um, talk about bringing back um, future um, reports and recommendations on other programs, um, as well as this, and we'll um, we'll discuss that in those reports. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so you're good with that, Councillor Ferrier? Yep. Okay. Yep, thank you. All right, so moving on here to 8.2, which is RPT-21-70, Lawn Bowling Clubs. Uh, there's a report and a recommendation from Mr. Bradley, CAO. Can I get a mover? Mayor Bailey, seconder, Councillor Howes. Uh, CAO Bradley, did you want to speak to it or is the report is good enough as it is? Any questions? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I have uh, the, the report, I think, is fairly comprehensive, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Questions to the report. Councillor Gatward, then Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page um, three and the top paragraph, it states that um, the former town of Paris entered into an agreement with the Paris Club um, to assume ownership of the property and to maintain and manage the property for the use of the lawn bowling activities. Then it goes on to say that the county performs all ground maintenance, play field maintenance and other maintenance activities. And I believe at the St. George Club, they do those um, the maintenance, they had us help buy a lawnmower so they could cut their own grass. So first question is, did they not assume ownership of the property? Because this says it, they did, unless that all fell through, I don't know. And the second question is um, that we, in my opinion, need to make, if we're going to pass this recommendation, make both clubs equal in what they do to maintain their clubhouse and their grounds and their bowling greens. Um, we don't get any recreation fees from these people that play lawn bowling. I don't know, there was more financial information in here about the St. George Club, but nothing about the Paris Club. And they have more members. I don't know what their membership fee is, how much they contribute and how, whether they do any fundraising. It was obvious that St. George had fundraised $20,000 worth of money to help with their responsibilities on site. So I guess I'm just thinking that 
if we're going to move forward um, to continue to work in partnership with both of those clubs that it, it needs to be on the same footing and for them, in my opinion, to at least take the same responsibility as the St. George Club. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bradley, response? Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mr. Chair. So first of all, just to maybe to clarify that, uh, and maybe my, my statement here is a, a bit misleading, I'm not sure, but the, the former town of Paris acquired the property from the club, not vice versa. So my understanding, the club owned the property and then the former town of Paris in 1984 acquired it or assumed its ownership from the club. So again, I think uh, Councillor Gatward may have got that in reverse. Um, so again, now we do know own the property. And it, it, it wasn't the intent of my report to debate or, you know, I, I will fully acknowledge, and I think the report very clearly articulates that the two clubs operate on different uh, philosophies. They're not connected clubs. And that's, that's evolved over time uh, as, as a result of how the clubs have, have evolved. And I would suspect it's a product of their membership and the nature of the clubs and, uh, and the relationship they had with the uh, former uh, municipalities and how that's passed on to the county. So, um, you know, my report wasn't intended to, uh, to analyze that. That could be a subsequent or report or a subsequent discussion. Um, but currently my report was really just about the, the, you know, the, the request to consider options on the future of these, of these properties. I, I would note there is attached to the report um, there was the recommendations of the uh, of the of the renewal study that was done uh, with between staff and the Paris Club, and I believe one of those recommendations does uh, you know talk about um, you know the need for the Paris Club maybe to uh, to to become more active in the in the maintenance and activities around the uh, the turf uh, the, the turf surfaces there. So uh, that's that's my comments to that, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Miller. I think and then Councillor Chambers. Um, I just want to say I always enjoy reading the Bradley report. <laughs> always well written. Um, I just want to um, highlight the, the the very last sentence um, in his report uh, uh, as far as conclusions goes. Staff also suggests that um, as the COVID-19 pandemic draws to a close and as activities with these two lawn bowling clubs normalize, discussions with the clubs about formalizing their relationships with the county should be considered. And if I heard Councillor Gatward correctly, I think that would address uh, her concerns. Um, some of the clubs may be not being on equal footing with the county. And um, Mr. Chair, uh, at the appropriate time, I, I will make that uh, an amendment to this motion that uh, asked staff to do just that. So I'll, I'll wait till, till the appropriate time. Thank you for that. Councillor Chambers, you had something? Uh, yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, you, you'll probably recall that uh, prior to um, this committee being formed, we had the uh, uh, Community Service Committee, and we had a, a, a presentation and discussed lawn bowling in great detail as it relates to our recreational master plan. I noticed in the report, uh, uh, CEO Bradley uh, refers to recommendation number 36, which is kind of a uh, a blueprint, a blueprint on where we were going to go with lawn bowling in the county as it relates to our recreation master plan. I'm just wondering if, if uh, through you, we either um, uh, CAO Bradley or, or uh, uh, General Manager Stevenson would like to comment on what we had decided to do uh, less than, I think it was two years ago or a year ago. Maybe you remember better than I do, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bradley. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think if you look at the, the recommendations that are attached to the, uh, to the report regarding the Paris Lawn Bowling Club there, they're consistent with that master plan recommendation. They talk about uh, renewing the, the, the Paris Clubhouse and, uh, and, and, and redeveloping it as an expanded use year round facility. So, so I, think, I think we've achieved that certainly with, uh, or with what the intent is with the, with the Paris Club. And I think the next step in that is to, to, to move forward with the design of the, of the expanded renewed facility. And as my report mentions, it's been deferred in the budget because we, you know, we've had some challenging budget years, but I think you know, they, eventually uh, that, that, that activity that we've been deferring in the budget will probably 
uh, get into the budget and we'll undertake that design. And then that if, the, if that facility renews, um, then we'll have met that, that, that objective in the master plan. And in terms of the St. George Club, I think it's already meeting the master plan. It, it, that, that, uh, that facility does provide um, you know, community use. It's, it's, it's used by several groups uh, that I know of here in the village and, uh, and it's available for community use. So, so I think we're, you know, generally right now, the status quo is achieving um, what our objectives in the master plan are for the, uh, for the lawn bowling clubs. And I think, you know, the, the point that was, was brought up with, uh, by Councillor Gatward about the, you know, the fact that the clubs, you know, operate on a bit of a different philosophy. And, and that was the really you know, noted in my, my closing statements about and maybe we do need to formalize the relationship. It does seem right now that, uh, that the, the relationship isn't, is, uh, is, is loose, for lack of a better term, with each of the clubs, and we should formalize these things. Um, and that was one of the recommendations in the Paris, uh, the, the, the Paris uh, renewal initiative as well. So. So I think generally we're uh, we're on track based on what we committed to or felt we should be committing to uh, back a few years ago when we uh, when we finalized the uh, rec the county's recreation master plan. Councilor Chambers, you're good with that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to to make one more comment, Mr. Chairman, and that is I think when we discussed that uh, in terms of the recreation master plan, we did recognize that there were going to be costs associated with that, mm -hmm. and. Uh, obviously dependent on budget. And as it played out, uh, we've kind of delayed uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, progress uh, in achieving the uh, ultimate uh, plan in terms of uh, delaying it maybe this year or as budget allows. So I think we're within keeping of the recreational master plan. Uh, perhaps some of the expenses and uh, uh, costs associated with uh, developing and continuing lawn bowling as a recreational activity in, in the County of Brant is where Council Wheat was coming from uh, because they, there are substantial costs and, and we have to be cognizant of that. And uh, I'll, I'll conclude by saying once again that uh, in my area, uh, it is uh, shorter to go to Norwich and uh, uh, join their lawn bowling club there, which is totally owned and operated by themselves. So it is possible for lawn bowling clubs to have their own facilities and exist uh, independent of the municipality. Uh, example, Norwich Lawn Bowling Club, which has been in existence for over hundred years and is within uh, uh, five minutes of, of many of our residents uh, in the Southwestern part of the county. Okay. Councilor Howes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is, is it okay with, if I do a comment rather than a question? Any other questions? Come back to you, Councillor House. Councillor Wheat, question? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, is the recommendations, are we supposed to pick one of the four options that were listed? To go with the recommendation. Uh, bear with me one second here. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, John. My understanding is, it's, is there's uh, there's the, the final recommendation that it, uh, oh no, it, it is, they recommend a status quo as well. So that is one of, that is, yes, there's the four we have to choose from. Yeah. Councillor Howes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to, uh, I, I appreciate the, the report. I support the idea of keeping status quo. Um, we as a council spend a lot of time talking about residential growth. And, and we know that Paris and St. George are the two areas that are going to experience the most significant residential growth over the next few years. And part of our job, I think, is, is to steer the community into the most agreeable future that, that we, can, we can manage. And, and one of the ways that we make growth agreeable uh, is, is to support and, and encourage recreational activity and recreational facilities. So I, I, I think we, we definitely want to be looking at more recreational facilities and more, more recreational activity like this, like pickleball, um, not, and rather than less, we, we want, I think we want to be more involved in delivering these. And I, I think the issues of things like the facility renewal that's a separate conversation in terms of timing and prioritization and, 
and when we do that. So, but I, I am very much in support of of uh, of uh, keeping the status quo and uh, notwithstanding the example of Norwich, um, through the Ontario Parks Association, I looked at a number of different examples of how other municipalities uh, approached their lawn bowling facilities and and what we're doing is not inconsistent with with what a lot of municipalities do. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, Councillor Bell. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to uh, Michael, I guess. Uh, option one, which is the ownership transfer for nominal consideration. Uh, I think there is a clause somewhere in there that should uh, the bowling club decide they don't want to keep uh, on being the owner, it reverts back to us for also a nominal consideration. So we don't actually lose the land value, for example, of that property, even if we, for a period, uh, offer it up to the Lawn Bowling Club. Is that correct? Yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, through you, yeah, that's, that's what we've done in the past. And I think I, I noted that in my report that I think it says in the event that they cease to exist, we would have first right of refusal to reacquire the property for the, for the, the nominal consideration. And then that would allow us to determine what its future was, possibly another municipal use or surplus. Um, but, but again, it keeps that asset at least in the community's hands, um, if in the, and especially if the case that the, that the group uh, ceases to exist. So that's what we've done with other uh, tra similar transfers. Okay, so uh, my apologies to committee. Um, Councillor Wheat, you're exactly correct. There's, there's four options here. We should have uh, had a motion on the table for one of the options before we started talking about it. Um, so we do have four options here to go. Um, we need a mover for one, Councillor Wheat. Mr. Chair, there is an option on the table, or sorry, there's a motion on the floor. And but the, the status quo. The status quo is the motion on the floor? That's that was correct. by Councillor yeah. House. Mayor Bailey and Councillor House. Okay. My apologies. I am confused here. Councillor Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will introduce an amendment to the status quo that staff enter into discussions with the clubs about formalizing their relationships with the county. If I can get a seconder, I would gladly speak to it. Councillor Ferrier, second that. Councillor Miller, go ahead and speak to it. Just simply. Um, I, why we're here, why we're having this discussion, why this report came forward is I think we recognize, the majority of us recognize that uh, there needs to be some things perhaps changed with these long bowling clubs. And um, if we are going to be asked to uh, invest some money from, from rate payers into some of these clubs, which it sounds like, you know, it, we will be, um, we know that. Um, I don't want to just pay out the money without having some kind of, you know, something more concrete. And that's why I would like to see us enter into a more formal agreement with these clubs. It would also address the fact that maybe um, we're not treating them quite the same. And, and if, you know, another lawn bowling club comes along, well, then, you know, we can treat them the same as the other. So that, that's why I'd like to see maybe more formal discussion or formal agreement. That's why I bring forward the amendment. I thought, I thought it was a good uh, statement in, in Michael's conclusions and, and I fully support it. Appreciate that. Anybody need anybody want to speak to the amendment specifically? Okay, seeing Councillor Gatwork to the amendment. Thank you. So through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Miller, is your intent then for them to be, all be treated equally financially on whatever staff comes up with in a formal agreement, like fundraising and the same membership fees and yeah, um, yeah. I don't want to speak for you, Councillor or for Councillor Miller here, but my assumption here is that as was in Michael's report, it's just stating the to, to formalize a relationship with the county. So I think anything is on the table at that point in time. Yeah. Is that a fair statement, Councillor Miller? Uh, yeah, yes, Mr. Chair, um, and that's why I would leave it to staff to actually come up with the, the, that formal arrangement, but at the same time recognizing that that formal arrangement will come back to us, right? For, Absolutely. For that, so. for You're, good with that? You're good okay. with that, Councillor Gatward? Okay. Thank Anything you else? for the... Um... 
No problem. Anything else to the amendment specifically? Okay, voting on the amendment, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, now voting on the original motion as amended, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion's carried as amended. Okay, uh, moving on to 8.3, RPD-21-49 for the taxi fare increase, rate increase. There's a recommendation on the, there, can I get a mover? Councillor Coleman, seconder, let's get it on the table. Councillor Chambers, discussion on the recommendation. Councillor Miller, Councillor Gatward, Councillor Laferriere. A, a question, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, those fee increases that I'm looking at, um, sorry, I gotta switch back and forth. Uh, okay, so we're looking at County Staff Recommendation 260, which I, I guess I should point out <laughs> that is lower than the request from either of the taxi companies. Um, is that is that HST included or is HST on top of that? I just need clarification on that. So, Mr. Bergeron, are you able to speak to that? Yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we've checked with our finance and, and uh, we don't include HST on our fare rates. We leave that to um, the businesses to make that decision if they want to charge HST over and above the fare rates or include it into the price. Okay, so they could charge that and then the HST on top or, or at their discretion. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Correct. Okay. Councillor Gatwork. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the taxi industry has been impacted all over since COVID and Uber and Lyft have come into um, existence. And um, I'm wondering if somebody could tell me how did the staff come to these recommendations for rate increases. Um, in other words, 260 instead of $3, for instance, and $30 to $40 for hourly waiting was asked for. And I think we're giving um, less than that. I'm just wondering how did staff calculate out what the rate increases should be? There were a number of different uh, factors that we, we took into consideration. We looked at uh, some of the um, area municipalities and what they were doing, and there's different schemes that you can use. Um, so we tried to find a balance here that would, A, try and remain, you know, have our heart taxi companies remain viable and be, um, you know, be responsible to the consumers that are using. Um, these uh, these taxi cabs. <clears throat> um, so we did a comparative analysis, and this is what we came up with. Um, and I think we're we're pretty close to you know on par with Norfolk, Haldeman, um, Waterloo. We're slightly higher than those three, but we have lower waiting times as well. So I think we're we're quite close. Um, we did the analysis with you know what they were recommending uh, or what the taxi companies had asked for, and um, you know we we thought that those were too high um, for the consumer. Um, basically, if you look at the fare rates that we're proposing as opposed to the fare rates that are in place now for a ten kilometer ride, for instance, um, that's a that's a significant jump for the consumer. You're looking at um, in the area of six dollars. For a ride that you know one day you take is is uh, twenty four dollars, and then the following day it's thirty dollars and fifty cents. So these are some of the things that we we considered and had to try and find a balance. Thank you. And do you know if any of those adjoining municipalities or the ones that staff checked are in the process of looking at changing their taxi rates and bylaws? Uh, we've called a couple um, and spoke to some, and uh, the two that I spoke to, I believe it was uh, Norfolk, 
and Haldeman. I think they went through their fare increases last year. Um, and I'm not aware if anybody else is, is uh, proposing any rate increases at this point. Okay, because ours, our rates have been the same for four and a half years. And all you have to do is look at the price of gas today and licensing and all the expenses to know that costs have risen. And um, did you look at Oxford? No, I don't think it's included in this report through through you, Mr. Chair. It's it's not included in this report. And the reason I ask that is because I believe Paris Taxi operates there as well. And I'm just curious as to what rates they would have compared to Brant's rates. So thank you. Julie, did you want to add to that or? Yes, through you, uh, Chair. Um, we did, um, Waterloo actually just went through their taxi rates. So their increases was as of January, 2021. So other than that, uh, Greg pretty much covered off everything else. Thank you. Councillor Ferrier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I have a couple of questions through you to uh, Greg. I really appreciate the report, and um, I also appreciate the the letters we received from both taxi companies. That was a big sticking point for me earlier, is we want to act um, with input from both. Um, I, I'm a little confused about one piece, and it's it's somewhat close to what what Councillor Gatward has, was saying. Maybe it's slightly different, though. A slightly different um, question. So we went under for two of the rates, the, the base rate and the and the kilometer rate in, in this recommendation of what both companies agreed would be uh, beneficial. We're in pretty extraordinary times. In the report, somewhere in there, and I can't find it on my screen right now, but somewhere in there you had said, you know, that all this being said, when we look at affordability, these companies can choose to provide a, a rate lower than if they so choose. So we're really only setting the maximum just because we set a maximum doesn't mean they have to hit that maximum. So it, it it's just a little confusing because in the report itself, it says we didn't want to sort of meet this request that, that both companies agree on. But it's also saying that we could, you know, by the way, affordability could be maintained through competition. And if both companies choose to have a lower rate. So could you kind of explain, you know, with that in mind in, in that report, how, how we get to the to not meeting the, both requests to some degree. And, and on the affordability piece, I, I, I think about that and similar to what Councillor Gatward said, you know, if, if we don't have these increases regularly and do we have a mechanism to have these increases yearly or, or, or every two years so that we don't see these big jumps for the consumer, because yes, it's going to be a big jump from, you know, 24 to $30 or $22 to 28, but that's going to continue if we don't have some mechanism in place to just do this incrementally. Um, we're just going to come back here in four years and have to, to shock the consumer again. So, so can, I guess two questions there. One about why not allow a maximum that both, you know, that both companies agree on um, in these uncertain times, but also what can we do to not have this uh, pause and then huge jump happen again? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So to answer your second question, there, there is going to be a mechanism and in speaking to other municipalities, we, we've learned a lesson there that, you know, we should be canvassing um, and having some more dialogue with our, our taxi companies. And, you know, it's certainly in, in the best interests of the companies and, and the residents themselves that we, um, you know, uh, touch base, you know, every year or every other year to see how the fare rates are and if uh, increases are required. What really exacerbated this, this increase here was basically the, uh, the, the impact that COVID has had on the taxi industry. Um, the cost of fuel is extremely high. There doesn't seem to be any um, indication that it's gonna go down and the insurance rate has skyrocketed um, in the past year or so. Um, so this is why this particular increase is, is high. Um, we, we wanted to cap it um, just, to, just as, a, as a mechanism for, for consumer protection. Basically, we put a maximum on there and, and they can certainly negotiate that um, they can negotiate lower rates with um, their consumers. There's also some ability as well um, to um, 
you know, get more revenue um, when you're uh, performing rides. Um, I believe it was from midnight to 6 a.m. Um, because I think that's that's one of the problems that we were encountering is that, you know, we were worried that there weren't enough um, vehicles for, for hire um, in the middle of the night, right? So we, we kind of tried to deal with that problem with, you know, this, this amendment here. Um, so I don't know if I really answered your, your question, um, but certainly we, we maxed it and, you know, we want to max these, these rates to try and um, put some type of cap on it to, to protect the consumer. So I, I guess if, if I can have a follow-up, a quick one, yep. uh, Mr. Chair, through you uh, to Greg. Um, I, that, that makes that makes some sense. I, I would have supported the whatever joint maximum both companies said they needed, just because of the unprecedented times we're in, to be, to be frank, and the ability for them to do lower if need be. I mean, with with the piece here now that we have around, there is there are other options uh, for folks. Where it's not it's not leaving the consumer in in the dust if if companies make a bad choice and price themselves too high. However, um, if we have one or both companies uh, come to us uh, six months a year from now, are we able as a council to revisit this and and you know do an increase based on a need if 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 so needed, or is this sort of set until uh, again this is my first taxi bylaw on council is this set until the next time we come and you know and when will we get details about that that incrementalism piece that we'll be able to 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 factor in in the future? Well, through you, Mr. Chair, um, it, it can come back anytime. I, I think that if they submit uh, some information to council through the clerk's department, um, this can become a, a live item once again, uh, certainly. Thank you. Uh, Jyoti, you've come on here. Are you gonna add to this? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes. I was gonna support what Greg has just said. He's absolutely correct. Council has the ability to come back and revisit their bylaws as needed. Um, the issue of the cap, and I just wanted to add one piece to Greg's answer, um, is that it's a policy decision for this council to make when it decides to include some type of a cap or ceiling as it relates to the fare. So while the taxi companies would have liked uh, a larger amount, by if you, if you went ahead and accepted that, then that's, that becomes your ceiling and they can go as high as that. And you're leaving it to the consumer then to have to negotiate down from that. By, by putting together what Greg has tried to do is a balanced approach and looking at all the other municipalities and what they're doing and also feeding into what the consumers are saying. And you're gonna hear um, in the next report, um, an update with respect to the taxi bylaw. We, we have that in the background, the comments that the consumers are re, have been telling the county um, that some of these rates are, they're already finding the existing rates were pretty high to begin with. So this is why the recommendation was let's try and find a balanced approach, something that's not too excessive because uh, the consumers are already going to find it um, high and it doesn't allow for <clears throat> the taxi companies to have to get into a negotiation with those consumers as soon as they get in the cab. I don't know if that helps with the, the uh, thank, response. Thank you. I, I agree, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the responses from all staff. I much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it, Councillor Miller? My apologies there. I, I did have a second question and Greg actually triggered it. Um, in the report, Julie states on page 153 or page seven of her report, um, she states, um, this is the third last paragraph of the report. It says at this stage and in the interest of public safety, despite GRC's request to abolish the requirement to operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, staff are not recommending that approach. And I think if, I, I understand where Grand River Cap is coming from with that request, if they're not getting a lot of business, they might wanna not staff it because they're losing money on those hours. But what I don't, what I'd like a, maybe a little more um, detail is why is this in the interest of public safety? I have my own thoughts, but I, I'm just wondering um, what Julie was thinking when she put public safety. Julie? Sorry about that. Through you, Chair, to uh, Councillor Miller. Um, yes, at this point, because again, the next report, we're going through the whole bylaw, bylaw process, 
um, for a whole new taxi bylaw altogether, that was when we were going to touch on two of the matters, which include 24 hours a day, the requirement for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as well as the requirement for office space within the county. Um, both of those are being touched on in the next report. Um, so we just tried to keep this report um, dealing with the rates themselves. Okay, fair enough. Sorry, Mr. Chair, follow up. But what did you mean by public safety? If they didn't operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the public yeah. safety is at risk. What were you referring to? Absolutely. Use that word Again, public safety. Absolutely. Again, through you, Chair. Um, just that the community wouldn't be stranded, that uh, the requirement 24 7, meaning that somebody has to answer their phone to come and pick up somebody because the taxi. Um, because the taxi companies are required to do so. So it's the it's the safety of the community, not necessarily the safety of the uh, taxi establishments. <laughs> no, I understand it's the public safety. I got that, yeah. thank you. Um, but what I would say in just generally a comment on that is that if they go out of business, <laughs> aren't we putting public safety at risk? And I think, I think they know their books better than we do. I, I understand what, what staff is saying, you don't want the public to be overwhelmed by uh, gouging, but at the same time, <laughs> they're, they're, they're not um, they're not a charity, right? They have to run a business. If it's not profitable, we don't have businesses that are profitable. They shut down. So that, that, I, that's what I'm seeing. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Gatward, final comment. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I think the public safety would look to the, the bars emptying, emptying out at one or two o'clock in the morning whenever they close. And if people are not, and recognize they're not fit to drive, would call a taxi. And that is a good thing to keep impaired drivers off our roads. I guess, um, what I wanted to ask, could we put in the recommendation that these rates be effective um, May 1st? We don't have a date in the report that I saw. And I think it was said earlier, we can implement water rates for May 1st. So we should be able to implement taxi rates for May 1st also. Is that a, a reasonable date to set? Uh, I can respond to that uh, through you, Chair. Um, realistically, once Council approves the minutes and uh, the recommendation, then it goes into effect. We don't so. need to put in the facts of May 1st. So if Council is next Tuesday and they approve it on Tuesday, then we work on putting it into place for the Wednesday. Thank oh, you. that's even better then. Thank you very much. Okay, no other questions. So we do have a recommendation on the floor, seconded. I will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Recommendation is carried. Um, moving on to 8.4, the RPT-2171 County of Brant Taxi Bylaw Review. There is a recommendation stated there. Can we get a mover to get it on the floor? Councillor Wheat? Hello. Councillor Miller? Um, do we want to, does, Brittany, do you want to speak to this report or are you just want to answer questions? How do you want to go? Good evening, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm happy to speak to it if the committee requires, but if the committee feels comfortable in having reviewed the report, I'm happy to just answer questions. Okay. Yeah, I think everybody's read the report. So questions to the report. Councillor Gatward, Councillor Miller. You're on mute, Councillor. Sorry, thank you. Originally, we were looking at the taxi bylaw, and now it's been changed to um, trans um, transportation um, for hire or whatever the term is, um, because there's Uber and Lyft. Could we not separate 
as to not, the taxi industry is regulated. Uber and Lyft aren't regulated the same, I don't believe, as taxi services. So could we not separate and have a separate taxi bylaw so we don't complicate things? And we already have a draft we've received from the consultant and then do Uber and Lyft as a separate bylaw because they are regulated differently. That's my question. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Gatward, um, we certainly could proceed under that direction if Council um, so directs. That being said, when we uh, staff conducted the consultation with the public and with um, the taxi companies, it was made clear to staff that the desire is for um, transportation network companies, so those companies like Uber and Lyft to be regulated similarly to taxis. So for that purpose and in the draft bylaw, which we have received, it does make it consistent to a certain degree between the taxi companies and the private vehicles for hire. So there is a distinction with respect to the brokers, but when it comes to the requirements of drivers and owners, those would be similar to the same regulations that are imposed on taxi uh, cab drivers. So that is why we proceeded um, under one bylaw. Um, once we have the bylaw in a position to present it to um, committee, you'll be able to see that the way that it is framed, it's fairly easy to understand how both are um, taken care of under one bylaw. That being said, we could break them out if we were directed to do so. Well, thank you for that answer, um, Brittany. I, I guess um, if we're going to ask for police checks and licenses and all the same things as we have for taxis for these other two companies, then maybe it does make sense to have them under the same roof. Um, will the rates also be similar so that it's competitive? So the rates for, the, uh, sorry, um, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Gatward, the, um, the rates for private transportation companies are not um, regulated under the bylaw. That being said, it's a different structure in that private vehicles for hire will have to pay a much higher licensing fee, and then we'll be required to remit to the county um, a fee per trip. So that is um, aiming to account for the increased administrative cost to the county in regulating a new form of transportation. But the fares themselves um, are not currently um, set a cap under the bylaw. I see. So the fee per trip would be no matter whether it's a local or lengthy out of town trip. Um, to Councillor Gower, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the fees which are set um, through transportation network companies, it isn't a um, set fee in the same way that taxi companies operate. When you um, go into the app as a prospective passenger, the fee um, will be dem will show up on the screen. So it, it varies. So it varies based on a number of factors, the time of day, um, how many vehicles are available, uh, the demand, all of those factors change the fee in the application. So in order to have the application work in the county, it would follow that same um, structure that it does throughout all other areas where Uber and Lyft operates. So it's much more difficult to regulate the fee for those types of companies. Okay, thank, thank you. For that. For that. Thank you. I have a better understanding now. Any other questions? Councillor Bell and then Councillor Miller. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to, uh, to Brittany. Um, We've now called the taxi bylaw a vehicle for hire bylaw. And at the end of that first paragraph, you said, of note, brand e-ride is exempt from the draft bylaw. Could you ex just explain to me and to the public why that is the case? Um, absolutely. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Bell. Brand e-ride is exempt from this bylaw because it isn't 
a privately run um, transportation company. Brant E-Ride operates more similar to a public transportation that the county is providing to its <clears throat> citizens, much more similar to, um, for example, a bus, but um, a mechanism that takes into account the geographic capacity and capacity of the county. So it's more of a public system than a privately run transportation system. So for that reason, it has been excluded from the bylaw. Thank you. The, sorry, the operation of Brand E-Ride is governed by um, our contract with Brand E-Ride. And so there are those mechanisms for um, protection of the public and fair um, increases in things of that nature in that agreement. So it doesn't need to necessarily be covered in this bylaw as well. Um, Councillor Miller, back for the second time. See, this is the first time. Oh, I'm sorry. I I had your name down there. I just didn't call you. Sorry. You did. <laughs> okay. I'm um, sorry. Um, but I'm, I'm glad Councillor Bell and Councillor Gottward went first because they both asked two questions that I had. So that brings me down to three. Um, to to Brittany, through you, um, when will we see the report? Are you expecting um, through you, Mr. That? Chair, to Councillor Miller, we have received a draft report from um, from the consultant. We received that. It was temporarily put on hold due to COVID, as a number of other things were. We did receive the draft report and draft bylaw in December, but upon staff's further review of the report, there were a couple of issues that we wanted to discuss with the consultant and have the consultant amend before bringing it forward to council. And one of the big pieces that is currently being discussed is with respect to potentially um, having some sort of reciprocity between the county and the city of Brantford. And because they, they are also currently reviewing their taxi bylaw. So um, staff currently has a meeting set up with the city um, in mid-April. And then we're hoping shortly after that to have an idea of when we will bring forward the uh, finalized report and a more finalized um, bylaw. Okay, soon, <laughs> is I hope. Um, so second question then, um, so going back to the previous report where Julie talked about, you will be looking at hours of operation and the fact that maybe they, whether they need a, a physical establishment in the county, you'll be looking at those two issues? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Miller. On the first note, with respect to an office in the county, uh, the draft bylaw does has taken out the requirement that um, taxi brokers have a office in the county. This helps to level the playing field between taxi brokers and now these private uh, transportation network company brokers who wouldn't have an office in the county. And staff is confident that any um, issues with respect to the parking of taxi cabs, which might have been handled by that requirement, will now be able to be dealt with through the zoning bylaw. With respect to 24-hour operation, the draft bylaw currently maintains the requirement to have taxi companies operating 24 hours a day. Um, I will note that in our public consultation, the majority of respondents um, indicated that the times that they require taxi cabs and transportation is between the hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So um, for that reason, the 24-hour um, requirement coincides with um, the need of the public. And also to the note of consumer protection, um, like Julie said, the 24-hour um, requirement helps to ensure that our residents who require transportation at all hours have that available to them. Okay, thank you. And then the last question, Mr. Chair, is, is as far as um, uh, um, taxi fare increases on a regular basis versus these one-offs, like the last one they had was four and a half years ago. Um, and it seems to take a while, even when they do come forward to, to get that through. Is that something that you could at least address and, and maybe, I don't know, streamline that process through this updated bylaw? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councilor Miller, that's certainly something that we can um, see about including in the bylaw. We can have um, discussions among staff what frequency that would um, best be achieved. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, and maybe, maybe at the end of the day you leave it out, but at least if you looked at it. I'd appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Thank you, Brittany. Okay. 
I'm not seeing any further questions on this. So there is a motion on the floor. All those in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? Recommendation is carried. Uh, moving on to 8.5, RPT-21-68 for brand E-Ride rebranding. There's a recommendation there. Um, can I get a mover to get it on the floor? Councillor Wheat and Mayor Bailey. Allison, did you want to speak to it or are you just there for questions? Well, Mr. Chair, um, really this is this report is really going to um, uh, a recommendation that came in the December report uh, with the, the contract amendment and staff are asked to bring back a report on uh, fair increases when they could be implemented and how we could improve uh, the growth and ridership of uh, the e-ride program and a recognition that uh, there were some deficiencies and, and lessons learned through the first year. So um, I believe that's outlined in the report and I'm happy mm -hmm. to answer any questions. Yeah, it's a good report. Um, questions to the report, Councillor Howes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to Allison. Um, I, I have two or three questions, um, and I appreciate the report, uh, and I understand that that uh, um, yeah we learn and we change, and 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 uh, the report was very helpful in helping us understand it. The one thing I I'm, I'm not clear on is do we have some data or even anecdotal information on how many county residents are currently using the service on a regular basis. I, I, don't, I don't have any, any perception of whether it's 50 people or 500 people. And then within whatever that number is, do we have a feel for what percentage are, are seniors? Is, is it half? Is it the majority? Is it a minority? And then lastly, uh, regarding the branding, and, and I, I, I agree that the brand rebranding is is necessary, but I, I'd, I'd like to offer, uh, uh, respectfully offer a, a suggestion, and that is, wouldn't it be even more clear if we called it Brant Transit? That would clearly send the message that this is not an inexpensive taxi service, and as the community grows, if we switch to larger vehicles like buses, it still, it still all makes sense. And, and it, it, it also helps to respond to some of the residents who, who say to us, why don't we have a bus service in, in, in town? Well, we, could, we do have a Brant Transit service and currently the level of demand that, that, that it requires indicates that we use vans or sedans or, or whatever. So, um, those are my questions, thank you. Allison. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so of the uh, rough, roughly um, total 15 to 20,000 um, rides we, we have logged, um, I would say on, on average about 20% of those users are regular users and that they have um, medical appointments or um, they use it for work. So they have pre-booked, um, rides that go on either on a weekly or a daily basis. Um, certainly we have repeat users, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them regular unless they sort of have those pre-booked rides. Um, and about 40 to 50% of the users currently are seniors. Um, and we classify seniors as we do with other programs in the County of Brown at um, 55 plus, which seems increasingly young to me, but I'm just saying that, that, that that's how we classify that. Um, I, and again, I, it's an approximation and I say that because uh, because we don't currently have a seniors rate, obviously we don't ask that as a, as a qualifier when people book rides. So um, it's just approximately knowing knowing the users we have. Um, in regards to the, the sort of rebranding and logo, we, we did do that work in-house. Um, our graphic designer did that, the original logo and, and the rebrand. Um, the, the only sort of logic we used of going to Brant Rides is, is not to deviate too far away from what the original name was. Um, we wanted to try to keep it as close as possible, but um, that, that could potentially have some disadvantages as you point out. And we're certainly open to suggestions um, if so directed to come back with some options on uh, Brant Transit 
um, or another name as directed. Uh, that, Councilor House. Thank yeah. Quick, just a quick follow up, and but and I share your concern that that in about a month I'm going to qualify for the senior discount. Um, <laughs> but but so so back to the numbers. Um, would we be safe, based on your knowledge? Would be would be we be safe in assuming that there are hundreds of residents who are using the service? On a regular, on a regular, repeated basis, like we're talking to hundreds of people, um, not thousands, but uh, but it's also not like fifty or sixty or seventy. There's hundreds of people using the service. Is that what I'm I'm hearing? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that that's correct. Um, and many of those users, I would note, also were using the what used to be the SDP or subsidized transportation program yep. previous to e ride. Um, many of those were transferred over, but we, we would be in the hundreds now. Um, I would note that we're going to be starting a couple more industrial pilots. The first one was quite successful, um, and that that takes people from the last stop uh, in at the with the Brantford Transit System uh, out to an employer in Canesville, um, and that transports uh, I believe it's between seven to nine uh, people who who use that on a on a daily basis, Monday to Friday. Um, so they go morning and evening. And um, when we're referring to group, group rides in that program, that's exactly what we're talking about is, is while we, it would be nice to have a sort of cut and dry um, parameter around how we'll do group rides. It just didn't make sense. Um, all the user groups are a bit unique. So we're gonna, attempting sort of employers and uh, long-term care and social service agencies on a case-by-case -case basis um, made much more sense. And it was very, feasible to do it really goes to, to the nature of the transit system um, that we operate here in the county so um, you know we, we do expect that number to um, you know at least double in this year as ridership goes up and we, we start these um, these larger programs uh, with various agencies throughout the county but we're definitely already in in the hundreds of users which I think is good uptake okay, thank you thank you thank you very much and 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 I I, I do think there is there might be some merit to to calling it Brant Transit, and I'd I'd be interested in in if anybody else has an has an opinion on that, and and I don't know whether that needs to be built into this as an amendment, Mr. Chair. Maybe you can guide me on that. Let, let's come back to that, okay? Um, question, Councilor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, on page. Um three of five of the report um, cost. It's saying, stating the general $5 flat rate. Does that replace the $3 rate? Or is that for anybody now that rides, whether they're in a group or single, it, with the exception of seniors who are $3? Uh, for Allison. you, Mr. Chair, so we did raise both the previous rates, which we had, which was $1 and $3 by two. Um, we did have ample feedback where, where people thought the rates were not appropriate um, and were too low. Um, and quite honestly, we didn't have many users, and, and this is you know largely due to COVID, uh, we didn't have many users utilizing the $1 fare because most people wanted to um, take single rides, uh, just out of fear of taking group rides. And for a period of time, we weren't able to offer those. Um, that being said, those, those are the general fares we are proposing. So a general $5 flat rate simplified the process. Um, previously, there was language of if you're in a hub or if you're taking a commuter program or it's this, and people were very confused by, by the language surrounding it which is why we wanted to move to, to a flat rate with maintaining that discount for seniors, recognizing their, their large proportion, possibly the majority of our users. Um, when we, we talk about the customization of group programs, that's where we could potentially have some flexibility. So if we were to get a program of um, a large proportion of users, they're all seniors and um, they go every Wednesday afternoon to the downtown core, or um, vulnerable residents um, when it comes to social service agencies and, and accessing appointments. 
that's where we could we could customize the programs based on um, those specific requirements. And so that that's the only way I could see us going back to a, a one dollar flat rate, for example, um, something like that. And we'd certainly bring those recommendations forward to council before we were implementing them. But that that's the kind of scenario where I could see a customized program that was slightly below those fares. But three and five dollars seemed um, in line with surrounding municipalities. Uh, public transportation and and the service we offer here. Thank you. And it, it, it didn't state in here anywhere about the one dollar going to the three dollars, um, unless I missed it. But thank you. And I'm pleased that we're raising the rates. And I think this is a heavily subsidized program for the costs. And because of that, because the county residents all the taxpayers are subsidizing this. Number six on page four of your report, um, it states that visitors to the County of Brant are encouraged to book a ride. I think they should use the taxi service, quite frankly, and support our taxi businesses. Because uh, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you there, Councillor Goward. I don't think we can tell somebody what to use as a, as a ride. If they want to call the e if they want to call the the e ride or or the new name for it, then that's their choice. We can't specify that they have to call a cab. Good for you. Well, no, but if we didn't make this service available for visitors, they would have to. Well, Councillor Gatward, if you think about what you're saying there, we're, we can classify a visitor as somebody from Brantford. So Wait, somebody from this, is, so, this is about the transportation rebranding. Questions should be about the rebranding, correct? Yeah, it, and it, he's uh, thank you, Councillor Ferrier, but Councillor Gatward is trying to suggest that um, that we tell them that we they can't use this this transit system. But what I'm saying, that the, 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 the question isn't relevant to the report. It is in the report, actually. It's counselor. in the report. Yeah, it's it in is in the report. report. But what I'm saying here is you can classify a visitor as somebody from Brantford. So, Councillor Gatward, what you're saying is that somebody from Brantford would not be able to use this system. And that is that we, we cannot say that. So, anyway, um, Allison, go ahead. I realize we're picking up. Councillor Gatward, sorry. Allison, go ahead. Um, through, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Gatward, um, just a point of clarification on that while, while, you know, visitors can certainly use it on a one-off basis. Uh, the the way we envision this really being used on tourism channels um, speaks to, for example, um, the delegation that appeared earlier and how we could maybe alleviate um, some congestion at tourist destinations and parking concerns by um, utilizing e-ride service for um, special events or, like I said, um, specific tour tourism destinations that experience congestion and concerns over over traffic and parking. Thank you for that. So as an example, Allison, um, pick them up at the um, Arlington and take them out to Glen Morris. Yeah. For you, Mr. Chair, that, that's a, certainly a possibility. Um, again, we haven't we haven't developed that specific programming, but it's certainly an option. Um, it's something that we, we let, would like to explore. It wasn't, um, it didn't make sense because we weren't promoting tourism at all um, really in this past year. But as we move forward, it, it makes sense that it's a market that we could tap into um, more so to alleviate other concerns, um, sort of secondary concerns to tourism versus uh, pointing tourists towards using that public transportation, transportation system just for general uh, movement around the county. It would certainly help with um, parking issues in places where they're gathering. However, I think they should pay more than five dollars for a ride out to Glen Morris. Just and, uh, that's my opinion, Mr. Chairman. And um, appreciate I, your opinion, Councillor Gatward. Anybody else with a question, Councillor Ferrier? I just want to confirm in in the branding that it's still gonna be a public transportation system and not a citizen of Brant transportation system? That is my understanding, Allison. Through you, Mr. Chair, that's that's correct. Thank you. Okay, okay. so uh, Councillor Bell. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, one comment and a couple of questions. Uh, I, I'm part of the fundraising team for the Community Health Hub. And as we've approached a number of donors, we've been asked the question, is there a transit system that goes past the health hub? So I, of course, share that we have brand E-Ride. Um, but taking up uh, Steve Howe's point, if we were to call it brand transit, uh, it would be much more readily understood by people who might be potential donors. And I think it would have uh, some benefit to the general public as well. Which actually leads me to the next thought. Have, if we're looking at pilots, as I think you mentioned, Alison, uh, has there been any thought to a pilot bus service in Paris? And by bus service, I mean using the biggest of our vehicles, which I think accommodates seven people. My thought, and it, it's prompted by requests from a number of residents, could we have a service that runs north to south, south to north, a few times a, a day, uh, and occasionally as we open up the health hub, from downtown to the health hub, or downtown to the Willett, or Willett to the health hub, could, could, you, could I ask that you, you consider whether that could be added to the uh, list of, of uh, transport uh, uses that we have? I, through you, Mr. Chair, that it's absolutely something we can do. It was it was sort of one of the benefits of, of the re, how we renegotiated this contract is um, it was the flat fee knowing that we were going to have a lot of these requests coming up as as we came out of the pandemic and as um, things like the health hub uh, were coming to the county. Uh, we wanted to be able to add in services on demand and routes on demand and not have to worry about how much that's going to increase our, our monthly costs. So we're at that flat rate exactly for that reason is so that we have that flexibility to really sort of right size the service over the next two years and have a much better idea of, of where that demand is going to be, how many routes we want and whether we need bigger vehicles, all, all of that sort of thing before, before we enter into any new contract with, the, with either this provider or another one. So it, in answer to your question, we, we can absolutely do that um, and, and we could do it really in short order. Thank you. Councillor Bell, that's it? Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions here. So I'm going to swing back to, to Councillor Howes. Um, are you looking to make a motion that uh, we reconsider the, the name of this to Brant Transit or how do you want to go forward with that part of it? Yes, please. I move that we change the name in the proposed rebranding to Brant Transit for the reasons explained earlier. And there's a seconder with that, Mayor Bailey. Um, any questions on that? Councillor Chambers. Just uh, curious, is there gonna, would there be a cost associated with that? And what would the cost approximately be? Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Chambers, uh, the design for the logo um, is was done by our graphic designer in-house. So there's, there's um, staff time to do that. There, there's no uh, outsourcing involved in that. Um, the costs, as out, as outlined, and and those can really range depending on how you know large we want to go with promotion. Um, but the the real definite cost is going to be approximately five thousand dollars to change um, the skin on the outside of the vehicles. Um, having said that, we need to do that anyway with um, entering into the MOU. Uh, with SCORE because we would have to be adding that logo in. So we could do that all at the same time at a fairly minimal cost. Again, two to $5,000 to do all of our vehicles um, and make sure they're rebranded. Um, most of our materials right now are digital. Um, again, that's all done in-house. Um, so it's just staff time involved in that. And um, again, depending on how, you know, if we want to do billboard advertising, print advertising, um, the cost can go up and we've applied for grant funding for that. So we would really scale how far we would go depending on how successful that, that ask is and, and those grant applications. But we can come back with, a, with another logo at, at no cost. Councilor Chambers? You're good with that? Okay. Yeah, and, and I think the, the, the point to make here is the fact that, you know, whether we're changing it to Brant Rides or Brant Transit, there's a, you know, there's a suggested logo change here. So the, the, the cost output is going to be there one way or another, regardless of what we, what we call it here. So, uh, Councillor Ferrier, you had something? 
Yeah, um, I just want to say I, I do like the design. I agree with Councillor Howes about changing the name. Um, I also think that with uh, Brant Rides, we have Ride Norfolk, then Brant Rides, then Brantford Transit, then you know Water Re Waterloo Regional. It, it, it does become a bit confusing, and I, I do think for the upgradeability piece that um, if if we're ever a um, have aspects of a more traditional transit system, I think that makes a lot of sense without mm -hmm. the confusion. There might be a little bit of brand confusion between Brantford Transit and Brant Transit, but that's something that's a, a larger, deeper issue between you know people confusing both jurisdictions anyway, and we're never going to solve that <laughs> if we haven't by now. Good point. Uh, so, so I do support uh, the work that's been done, but I think I think keeping the design very close to what it is and changing the the, the name. I think is is prudent for, for all of these reasons discussed today. Okay, so we've got a, a rebranding on the table with uh, an amendment to the motion to change the name to Brant Transit. Um, Councillor Gatwer, did you have something? Just, just yes. Um, Allison said three to five thousand dollars when Councillor Chambers asked about the cost. I wasn't clear whether that was to change all the vehicles. Or was that per vehicle? For you, Allison. Mr. Chair, to Councillor Gatward, that's for all the vehicles. Um, because uh, they're branded with the, the BTS service provider. We only really have um, the back and side windows that, mm -hmm. that would need to be changed out um, with, with the logo. So it's a relatively small cost. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So nothing further to the amendment. So I'm going to call a vote on the amendment First of all, all those in favor of the amendment of changing the name? Opposed? That motion is carried. So now to the original um, recommendation with as amended, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we are moving on now to section nine communications. I don't see any. Uh, CAO's update. Uh, Mr. Bradley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. Um, just a couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, Ms. Hewitt will be bringing a report to the upcoming council meeting next week on automated speed enforcement. Um, we didn't have that report quite ready for this meeting, um, but it, it will be seeking delegated authority for staff to enter into a whole range of agreements we're going to need to, uh, to, to, to trigger that activity, which was approved as part of the budget. So you'll see that next week. As well, next week at council, uh, Ms. Boyd will be bringing a report regarding the current um, meeting schedule, council committee meeting schedule, and noting that we're gonna be asking council to resume the policy development and strategic direction committee for next month. Uh, next month, uh, we are starting to see a fair, and I think tonight's a good example, it's a fairly busy night. And we're starting to, we've got a backlog of things that we're trying to get, get I think, um, completed that, that were strategic priorities. Uh, next month, you'll see the fire master plan as well as the employment lands need study at that meeting. So um, I just wanted to, there was a question about the St. George wastewater treatment plan. I can actually answer that question. It was about the, the $20 million cost estimate. And then I can confirm that that was a high level estimate we made in the 2014 development charges background study. And that estimate is carried forward pending the conclusion of the EA, which would tighten up the scale scope and, and extent of that project. So, and Mr. Walton, I think provided more thoughts to that, but I just thought that's why the, that's what the current price was based on. Again, it was, it was made really at the very early eight, uh, point of that EA. So I wanted to mention that I've received a letter from my counterpart at the city of Brantford uh, regarding cost sharing for, uh, for the various joint services that the city and county uh, share. Um, and it's requesting to uh, review those. I think uh, there was a report that went to city council that I think uh, several councillors probably saw um, on that note. So I will be doing some analysis and bringing a report to council in an in-camera session because we will be negotiating for these. So we, we do need to preserve our negotiating position with that. Um, but I'll be doing that as soon as I can to start that, that process to look at uh, the, the cost sharing arrangements for those services. Last thing, I just wanted to mention that tomorrow will mark the one year anniversary uh, that we activated our emergency operations center for the COVID-19 emergency. It's an emergency we named COVID-19 2020. I don't think most of us realized at the time that it would be a multi-year emergency, but I did just want to thank, uh, or Mr. Chair, I wanted to just uh, thank the members of our EOC and the extended team that supports them for uh, what has been a pretty, uh, pretty complicated year of, of challenging activities, situations, and decisions, and uh, appreciate my support for them uh, continuing. 
Uh, we did have our 94th uh, business cycle start today for that EOC. We had a busy meeting today, as I think the mayor can attest to, and I think we've got several more in our future before we, uh, we, we can exit out of this situation. It's my uh, report, Mr. Chair, and happy to answer any questions. Anyone with questions for the CAO? Councilor Gatwer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is, um, the joint servicing uh, letter that you received from the city, um, will we be getting a copy of that in our council package? And also, you mentioned some city, some councillors had seen the report that the city did, or did I misunderstand that? I'm just wondering if we could receive the report too, so that we can be prepared for discussion at the council meeting. Yes. Mr. Chair, through you, uh, so just to confirm, first of all, it would be my preference to include the letter in my in my initial report to council when I bring it forward. Um, it's 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 a big letter and and I think it, it, it would I would rather bring it forward with analysis at the time. So that would be my preference. Um, the letter was addressed to me by my counterpart. Um, secondly, the city council did receive a report from their CAO last year, I believe. Uh, uh, I, I, I believe several councillors saw that report. Um, it wasn't our report. Um, and if council would like, I can include that report as well um, when I bring my report forward. So, thank you. I like that. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Howes? A comment, if that's all right, Mr. Chair. Certainly. All right. Just, just, just uh, following along the CAO's comments about the the last year and and and. I, I just really want to emphasize the the compliment to all of our staff and to our CAO. Um, no one could ever have imagined what what the last twelve months was going to bring, and 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 our our staff and our CAO, everyone involved, really managed this community in a pandemic really really well. Um, we, we, um, I, I, I have great empathy, empathy for, for, you know, some people were affected by it more than others. I know we've, we've got a lot of staff who, who are, have been working through a lot of challenges. And, and I, I just think if, if, if you look around us, um, we can hold our heads high that this community had, has, has rode through this unexpected time very, very admirably. And, and that's a, a credit to everyone involved and especially to our CAO. Thank you for that, Councillor. Anything else? Councillor Wheat. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this question may not, it's more of a comment, but I'll direct it to a CAO, but I'll also include Mayor Bailey and our manager of community services, um, Cynthia Stevenson. Um, I'm really excited about the fact we're getting vaccines into Brantford Brant in the Brant County Community Health Hub. And I'm really overjoyed that it's being done at the Paris Fairgrounds as I'm a member of the Paris Fair. But I was really excited when I found out a few days ago, we're gonna take the ice out of the arena in St. George so that we can do a whole lot more people. But I found out today that we're leaving the ice in for another 10 days. And here am I, 75, and I'm eligible for the 75 vaccine, but they can only do so many people at the fairgrounds. We're using the boardroom there at the fairgrounds. We can do a whole lot more people at the arena in St. George. And now I think the COVID vaccine is the most important thing happening in the county of Brant, the city of Brantford today, not 10 more days of ice rental at the community center in St. George. And that's just my comment on whether the CAO or Mayor Bailey or uh, manager Cynthia Stevenson want to comment on that. I don't know, but I was really excited to find out that ice is coming out on the 21st and I can get a needle right here in St. George. Although I don't have a problem driving to Paris. I'll drive to Paris at three o'clock in the morning if I'm going to get that vaccine. 
Anybody want to comment on that or leave it as a comment? Mr. Chair, I can address the, the, the comment if you want. And so certainly we've we've made our, 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 our facilities available to the health unit, but they're the ones that will make the call on whether to open up or not. So our, our intent, and I think Ms. Stevenson circulated the, the ward councillors at Burford and uh, in St. George, will be to leave ice in as long as we can until we get, get to the end of the ice season. But if the health unit uh, comes forward and says, we're ready to move a vaccination clinic into those facilities, then, then we'll get ice out. But a lot of, I think a lot of the, uh, of, you know, what's dictating uh, the, 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 the creation of new vaccination clinics is driven largely by uh, the supply of the vaccines and, and really not the availability of space. Um, Ms. Stevenson may want to add to that. Uh, that's, that's my understanding, so. Okay, Cindy? Uh, yeah, just, just to add to uh, Michael's comments there, um, we've also offered up uh, uh, some other facilities to the health unit, such as the uh, St. George um, Fire Hall. Um, again, should there be supply available during that, that two week period um, where they could vaccinate additional residents and uh, not delay any vaccines, um, they have looked at that facility as well as an option. So, um, you know, if, if, they, if they are able to uh, vaccinate additional people beyond what we can accommodate the fire hall, then we certainly would um, provide the, the arena as the priority. So we're, we're, we're working with them um, as much as we can um, to ensure that there is no delay to residents for vaccines in the community. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Bell, do you want to add something to that from the Yeah, if I may, um, uh, everything that Cindy said is, is absolutely correct. Uh, I think what the general public should know is we have two mass immunization sites in Brant County, not in the county of Brant, but in Brant County. So one is at one market square in Brantford, one is at the fairgrounds in Paris. And right now the health unit probably could increase capacity there quite significantly. If they get to the point where they reach that capacity, then what the county has done, it has said quite openly, when you call upon us to use the arena at St. George or Burford, it will be made available. And that's the best thing the county can do. And I've tried to ask the city to do exactly the same to make their facilities available as and when required. But we also have one more facility open uh, in Brantford, that's at 355 Henry Street. That's the home of the paramedic storage unit. And it was specifically opened to help uh, the over 80s clinics in the Brantford area. There was some concern about uh, people going downtown uh, of, of a certain age, concerns about parking, about safety. So in response, we opened up 355 Henry Street, which was already being used by the paramedics and first responders for their uh, injections. And, and right now we have enough capacity. So John, uh, you may just have to go to Paris to get your, your shot and I would join you anytime to do it. I, I love the Paris fairgrounds. I'm married <laughs> to that place and I love it. Had a lot of meetings in the boardroom. That's where it's happening. And my age bracket is in the on deck circle. Yeah, just to be clear, the, 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 the actual shot in the arm is in the biggest hall. It's in the main hall. It's in the main yeah. hall. The, well, I, uh, I was told by Cheryl Muir that they were going to be using the boardroom. So. Oh, they are. That's part of the process. You come in through one door, get processed in the boardroom, go get your shot, sit down for 15 minutes, and then you're on your way. I yeah. can't wait. But I'm going to have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a, that's a good discussion on that. Um, Councillor Gatward, question? Through, through you, um, the CAO mentioned that we're going to go back to having those strategic um, meetings. I've forgotten the title already. I'm wondering about, we used to have community and protective services. Are, are we going to start those meetings or are they going to be part of another meeting? Through you, Cindy. Through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Chair. So just, just a reminder to Council that we adopted a new committee process last year 
It had three standing committees. There was a planning uh, a planning development committee, uh, this committee, administration and, and operations, and uh, strategic, and I can't remember the name either. I've got it written here. Policy development and strategic Policy planning. planning. Strategic direction committee. Direction. Those are the three committees. Uh, the community services committee and public works committee have been uh, discontinued. So they're rolled into which committee? Okay, so, so and just to clarify with council, we, the, the um, departments will no longer be reporting to specific committees. All departments will, re, will, will provide their, their, their um, report or content to either this committee, if it's, a, if it's a, what I would call an administrative or operational nature, and I call that business as usual, or if it's, if it's a strategic matter, a master plan, uh, uh, you know, something that's, that's out of the ordinary, as I like to call it, business as unusual, it will go to the, um, to the policy development and strategic uh, direction committee. So, so it's a new format. It, it has uh, undepartmentalized our committee structure. And tonight is a good example. You saw uh, reports from pretty much all of the departments on tonight's agenda. And when we, when we renew that second committee, then you'll see either the first committee will be the departments presenting strategic matters or for more regular uh, matters, you'll see them at this committee. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Ch Thank you. I, I guess somehow through COVID when things stopped, I've forgotten about that change and um, certainly I would appreciate a list, if there is such a list, of who does what and what department does the main reports come to this committee or that committee. Because sometimes um, you have a resident ask a question and you have to know where, which committee to refer them to. CAO Bradley, are you able to do that, do something like that? Mr. Chair, it would be my suggestion a is report. that that, that a, a, if if there's a resident that wants to come to council, they should be referred to the to the county clerk, and then I think she can work with that resident to figure out where their where their interest lies. I, I think that would be the more appropriate, as opposed to councillors maybe you know and residents trying to figure out which committee is more appropriate for their their specific concern. Um, Sounds good. So that that would be my suggestion is 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 that's the, the county clerk is happy to, to to talk to residents and figure out where where best they can their their issues should be uh should be brought forward to. Well, certainly operations is easy and other items are easy, but there's sometimes some items come up that aren't quite so easy. Planning and development's easy, but thank you for your answer. Okay, anything else for the CAO? That said, Michael, thank you for your report. Okay, so now I believe we are other business. Uh, nobody said anything about other business at the beginning, so there's nothing there. Uh, next is to go in camera. Can I get a motion to go in camera? Councilor? And uh, I, uh, we do have another meeting, so stay on the line. I believe Councilor uh, Mayor Bailey is chairing the next meeting. 